Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to the 23rd episode of Pure Grey Pro Rest. I am back from another extended break, but I am here back with, I guess, what is technically New Japan's like arguably their second or maybe even third biggest show of the year. This is the Dominion show from Osaka Joe Hall. Uh, this comes off the tail of the Best of the Super Juniors tournament. And look, I know, I'm a I'm a pro wrestling review channel, and well, channel, podcast, show, and I haven't even given a review or analysis or anything. I haven't even talked about the Best of the Super Juniors. Well, look, I'm going to give a very brief overview of that tournament at the very end of this episode. So if you really want to hear my thoughts on that, uh, stay tuned until the end. First of all, just going to get something off my chest. Atsushi Aoki from All Japan, uh, he passed away this week, uh, a day after my birthday actually, it was uh, fucking terrible, I was really like down for like quite a few days, so uh, yeah, you should go out of your way to check out some of Aoki's work, maybe check out his two matches from the Champions Carnival against Miyahara as well as Dylan James, uh, yeah, it's a real shame, I was just getting into his work, he was becoming one of my favourite guys in all of all Japan, and then he won the title, he was the junior champion once again after his awesome run in the Champions Carnival, and then this happens, uh, that's terrible news, sorry to have brought you guys down on what should be a celebration of overall a great show from New Japan, but um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that because, yeah, as I said, uh, Aoki's passing really, really crushed me, um, but yeah, look, let's get into New Japan, the Dominion show, so yeah, let's start it off with John Moxley, oh yeah, by the way, Dean fucking Ambrose, if you missed that, he's John Moxley again, and he's in New Japan, like fucking hell, you, you, you don't pay attention for a week, and then this shit comes out of nowhere, so yeah, opening match, John Moxley versus Shota Umino, uh, Moxley, obviously, you know, coming from Ambrose's in the Shield, he makes his cool entrance from the crowd, and then Shota, he's like, okay, yeah, I get you, you're the cool, you know, the cool western white guy who's making his, uh, big, big debut in the company, well, he already made his debut, but you know, his, his, big debut on like an even bigger show than the best of the super juniors and he's like nah fuck your shit i'm just gonna jump you right from the ring and, and he doesn't even just make a simple it's not like he just throws a forearm he does like a full-on like flipping sent on right over the ropes but from there moxley like he recovered incredibly quickly and then he just started beating the crap out of shota he did that really cool like full rotation uh release suplex then he also hit like some lariats i think he also hit the he had the dirty deeds, and he may have had one other move, but like, yeah, he had the dirty deeds, I don't know what they're calling it, I think I heard Kevin Kelly just call it a double underhook DDT, and I was confused, because in his match against Juice, like, he hit the normal dirty deeds, but that didn't get the win, then he did almost like a bloody Sunday, which was like an elevated dirty deeds, and then that got the win, but he didn't do that here, but I guess it makes sense, because it's Shota, I'm rambling, this was a fine little max, you know, match, Moxley, he looked good, uh, Shota, he looked fine, but the match was, it must have been like, maybe four minutes, if that, it was mostly just to get everyone, you you know, acquainted with Moxley once again after his great match against Juice, which I'll probably get into a bit more at the end of the show. So yeah, can I really rate this match? I can't. Um, it, it was fun. I, I'd recommend checking it out based on that. The real appeal here, not to say that this match didn't have any appeal on its own, but the real cool takeaway from this was that Moxley, um, he went on Mike in the post match and he's like, yeah, I'm going to be in the G1. And that is fucking awesome, okay? Because like, John Moxley as Dean Ambrose, I was never the biggest fan of his work, but I did appreciate some of his character work stuff. And after like his first match with Juice, I was like, okay, maybe there is a way that he can work the New Japan style, because even though that match, that brawl against Juice was totally not the usual New Japan, you know, big move trading style, it was still a great match, and if he's going to be in the G1 up against the likes of, you know, possibly Okada, Naito, Ibushi, Tanahashi even, um, that's really exciting, so, and that wouldn't be the first, uh, well, and only announcement of a G1 entrant on the show, so that's very exciting. Next match, we had Shingo versus Kojima, again, why are we getting, like, like, these two matches here, Moxley versus Shota, and then Shingo versus Kojima, they're two very interesting matches why were they like right at the start of the show like I do appreciate that because then the show starts off really strongly as opposed to oh have some young lions fight each other and the dads and then have like a bullet club versus lij tag match that no one cares about and then have those big matches not not big big matches but you know what I mean like interesting matches that we don't usually get so um yeah weird structuring on the show because you start off with these interesting matches and then you get to you know oh Suzuki and Saber versus Yoshihashi and Liger anyways I'm, ju I'm just rambling about the the structure but now nah, Shingo versus Kojima so this is Shingo's first foray into the heavyweight division in New Japan, and I was thinking, okay, this is a really good precedent, you know, right after an amazing match against Osprey in the Best of the Super Juniors Finals, which, once again, I will get to at the end of the show, and, and then it's like, okay, they're immediately pushing Shingo to heavyweight, so this was, you know, a very brawl and strike-heavy match, and it made sense that he'd go against uh, Kojima, because Kojima, he's also known for having some pretty thundering lariats, you know, big strikes, big power moves, at least in his heyday, is that the right term, heyday? 
Now that I'm saying it, it sounds weird. Anyways, uh, so yeah, this was a perfect matchup for Kojima as his first heavyweight match. Uh, both guys, they started like intermittently trading big power moves like very quickly into the match after just, you know, throwing a, a few strikes. And um, a few of their interactions became a bit awkward as the match progressed because, you know, Shingo, he's a, he's a big dude, he's very quick. And Kojima, he's, you know, probably about equal size, but he's nowhere near as nimble as Shingo, which has always obviously been one of Shingo's main appeals, uh, main, main appealing factors. So both guys, they did seem a bit off each other's pace at times. Arms, but luckily they did bring things back once they were just purely trading like massive forearms, lariats, el uh, elbows, like, you know, just trying to withstand everything that the other was throwing at them. Um, it was great seeing Kojima with someone who could really match him in intensity and power because when I think of Kojima's like best matches over the last like maybe four years, I feel like he's had those matches with maybe... I want to say, I definitely know at least Okada, maybe um, like Tanahashi, I feel like. I don't have any impressions of him having like a real big, you know, quote unquote strong style match. And this is what this sort of felt like just because Shingo's, you know, unleashing so much power behind all of those strikes. So um, yeah, it was really fun seeing almost like a, a glimpse of Kojima from like maybe 10 or even 15 years as he was trying to match this, you know, you know um, young, plucky youngster, not even really that young, probably more like 37 years old Shingo. And uh, Shingo, he eventually hit the last of the dragon. And it was a shame because he actually ended up hitting the Made in Japan, which he uh, first introduced in New Japan against Osprey in their big match. Once again, I'll get to that at the end of the show. And the Made in Japan is just such a beautiful looking move. Just the way he like, like there's two parts of it that build up suspense. There's actually trying to lock in that sort of like, uh, arm between the legs hold and the like clutch around the shoulder or the other arm and then there's actually lifting them up and then he like sort of dead lifts them and holds them in that position so there's two moments where the crowd is just you know biting on every single second like oh shit is he going to be able to lift him up and then oh is he going to be able to flip him over and actually drive him down and it's just such a perfect move and to have not only Osprey kick out of it which was fine and then have Kojima of all people kick out of it it's like okay I guess this isn't going to be like um, his big finishing move in the company which is a real shame because it just looks way cooler than Last of the Dragon but to be they both are essentially the same looking move you know it's like a death valley sort of driver that goes frontwards anyways he got that um got the win uh yeah this was very fun for such a short match i gave this like three and a quarter to about three and a half stars um yeah shingo he continues to look amazing kojima he doesn't usually get to show off he's usually fighting like you know alongside nagata or fighting Nagata or Nakanishi or he's like beating the hell out of a young lion like Narita and like that is fun but um it's nice to see something different from him for once in a while and um once again like the real big big thing here for this match like with Moxley versus Shota was that Shingo went on mic and he announced his intention now apparently there was some confusion at first it seemed like he's saying that he's going to go heavyweight but then it turns out he's actually intending to go the Osprey route of being a junior who faces heavyweights and this was followed up by him at least I definitely heard the words G1 so look he's in the G1 um yeah that is fucking awesome I didn't expect us to get this so quickly New Japan likes to really really fucking tease us with this stuff where it's like okay we have this guy but we're not going to give him what he deserves for like two years because quote-unquote storytelling and so I was I was prepared to be like, okay, Shingo, you know, if he doesn't win the best of the Super Juniors and then win the junior title, then it's probably going to take like, you know, another year before he even starts going heavyweight because I thought New Japan would want to make us just absolutely desperate begging for him to go heavyweight before they actually allow him to. But um, no, he has a, a very good best of the Super Juniors performance, an amazing match against Osprey, and then like he's going into another tournament. We're going to see like even more matches of him against the, you know, the top guys. Again, Osprey, um, who I think is also going to be in the G1, okay. Kada, Naito, Ibushi, who else? Ishii, like God, so many like dream matches right there. Um, I really, I was really questioning New Japan's choice to put him as a junior as he first came into the company. I was thinking, okay, look, that's a bit, you know, it's like you're trying to play down his efforts just because he came from a rival promotion. Not really even a rival promotion, but, you know, an alternative promotion like Dragon Gate, where they're like, it's like New Japan was trying to say, oh yeah, Shingo, he's coming into the company as a junior because, you know, Dragon Gate, they're the small guys. That's where all the small guys go. And they're, you know, we're the big time guys and he can't hang with the likes of Ibushi and Okada. So um, yeah, I, I think this was a very great it was a fantastic first year for Shingo um he's been a total destroyer ever since he came in his one major loss if and I think only I think like legitimately his only loss was against Osprey in an amazing match so um he's been very well built up and look I know like guys he's not going to win the G1 at all I'm gonna say chances of Shingo winning the G1 is like one percent no chance but um we should be thankful that he's even going to be in the competition he's going to give us some amazing matches so um yeah talked about that quite a lot let's get into the next match this was and as I, as I talked about earlier, this was in the show sort of was like, okay, we've given you the really interesting stuff, you know, Moxley's in the G1, Shingo's in the G1, let's get down to some uh, more mundane stuff as we have Suzuki and Saber from Suzuki-gun going up against Yoshihashi and Liger. 
So for this match, I actually thought it was pretty decent. We had Suzuki and Saber. They did a very good job working Yoshi over. You know, Suzuki, he's just being his usual sadistic self, and Saber, he's just being a total dickhead as he is in real life as well as in character in the ring. And he does a very good job of that. You know, just saying oi, oi, what are you doing? While kicking Yoshihashi in the head and going oi, 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 and also saying oi, oi. You know, I, th I think you guys get the point. And uh, Yoshi, he was firing up quite a bit as he as he usually always does when he's up against you know a, a dickhead and a killer like Suzuki and Saber. Reverse order for those two. Saber's the dickhead, Suzuki is the killer. And there was also a moment where Liger, he actually like hit Yoshihashi as a means to fire him up further. And it's like, Liger, I appreciate what you're doing, but Yoshihashi's already fired up. He was literally in the process of firing up right before you hit him. But um, I, I did like that idea. It's like, you know, Liger's just trying to really encourage Yoshihashi, you know, you know, take these bastards from Suzuki gone out. You know, you've got to do your best. Uh, Liger and Suzuki, they've had an extended feud, I think from this, I think from some point at the start of this year. And it looks like it's going to be built up for like Wrestle Kingdom or something I think and um yeah they had a few nice interactions Suzuki he's got you know obviously his great strikes and great holds against Liger and Liger he doesn't really have anything on Suzuki but he does obviously always fight back and that's always been Liger's charm for like you know the last five years he's not the most technical person anymore but you know his heart it's still there Yoshihashi eventually managed to roll Saber up with uh, some sort of like weird, you know, package cradle pin. I never know the actual terms for those like various roll up pins. I, I always just say, oh, that's a roll up pin, even if it's like a package or a small package or a baseball slide. You know what I mean? Like a quick sort of flash pin. But um, yeah, uh, anyways, he did that to Saber and uh, he got the win. And that was very satisfying. Look, I know uh, a lot of people will hate this, but I don't like Saber and Yoshihashi is totally my boy. So this was a, a very enjoyable result. And this also made sense because I believe it was on the final Best of the Super Junior show where Yoshihashi, I think he got, he definitely got the win over someone, and then he got into Saber's face, and Saber was like holding up the Rev Pro title in front of him, and I think Yoshihashi was like pointing to the title or pointing to Saber, and I was like, oh, okay, so I guess Yoshihashi is going to challenge, and um, look, I know people are not excited for that, but look, like Yoshihashi always goes out, goes goes out there. He always goes out there and impresses us when we always think he's going to be, you know, uh, dry as sand. And um, even though I'm not the biggest fan of Saber, he definitely can be great on his day. I think he's going to make Yoshihashi look very good. I think Yoshihashi's going to make Saber look good. Um, yeah, I'm excited for that match. It's probably going to be on the UK show. I'm guessing that makes the most sense because it is for the Rev Pro title. But um, yeah, anyways, this match it was fun. Yoshihashi, his baby face work has always appealed to me. You know, I understand he doesn't work for some people, but look, hey. For me, he does. I love Yoshihashi. Yoshihashi till death. So yeah, gave this match three stars. Um, yeah, nothing you really need to see on the show. If you're strapped for time, you do not need to check this out. And you certainly do not need to check out the next match. This was Tanahashi, Juice, and uh, Taguchi versus Jay White, Ishimori, and Chase. So um, I, I, the way I just realized, the way I said you definitely don't need to check out this match, it made it sound really bad, and um, there's a certain person's uh, bad books I don't want to get in again, but um, this wasn't a bad match, but it's just on the show, this was definitely the most skippable. There was actually a lot of history in this match, as we have a lot of pairings with previous challenges and previous, uh, you know, uh, aligned champions. Did I get that in the right order? Ch yeah, uh, previously aligned champions and challengers. So obviously we have Tanahashi, who was previously the uh, heavyweight champion, and Jay, who was the challenger who actually beat him for the title. Then we have Juice, who was the previous US champion, and Chase, the previous challenger. And then we have Ishimori, who was the previous junior champion, and Taguchi, one of the previous challengers. So we ran through a lot of those pairings in the match, and, you know, it was fine. We didn't really get any extended work from anyone. It was mostly just everyone running in and getting their stuff in. I did think that Tanahashi and Jay once again had the most interesting uh, interactions, just like with their uh, pretty good match from the final day of the Best of the Super Juniors. Everyone else was sort of just there. I would have liked to see a lot more from Juice and Ishimori, as well as probably Jay. There was a big focus on Tanahashi at the end. He was going up against Chase, and they had some, you know, fine interactions. Tanahashi was definitely looking off at times when he was interacting with Chase and uh as well as as well as jay and then for the final i have no idea what happened chase was obviously he was working really hard you know it was like oh you know we're going to do the usual tease because chase owens has a great offense it's going to look like he's going to put someone away but then he doesn't so he went through that with tanahashi tanahashi obviously survived uh, everything and then it was his turn to start working chase over and then tanahashi he brought out this new move which almost looks like goto's gtr where he's like holding them in a headlock position and then he swings down and this was like universally panned from what i've seen no one knows what the hell this was meant to be it looks like he was meant to like it was almost like maybe a crossroads now that now that i think of it i have no idea what the hell tanahashi was doing what part of your arm or what part of your body was meant to be damaging him tanahashi you know where was the impact meant to be between chase and the mat and you i've i have no clue um 
yeah, who knows if this is actually, I guess it is meant to be like a new finishing move, right? Why else would he bring that out? Why else would he bring that out on a big show like this? I can imagine that um, the idea was, okay, Tanahashi's back from injury. He's just, you know, lost to Jay White once again. Um, he needs to somehow do a move that can make up for his injured elbow or something. I have no idea if they're going to explain the kayfabe reasoning of that in some you know, backstage interviews, um, who knows, yeah, this was a fine match, uh, pretty messy, and yeah, as I said, not enough from certain members like Ishimori, Jay White, and Juice, probably a bit too much focus on Tanahashi, and like, I love Tanahashi, but yeah, he definitely did not look the best here, and I feel like I say this every year, like, where I get worried, oh, Tanahashi's, you know, like, he's legitimately, um, you know, falling off the horse, he's not looking as good as he has in previous years, um, I feel like I just have to accept Tanahashi, he's going to go on, he's going to have a great G1, he's going to prove me wrong, even if it was not the best performance here, he did still look kind of good, so yeah, once once again, a match I've spent too much time on, I've given this two and a half stars. We were finally back to the properly good matches on the show, as we then had Taichi, the never openweight champion, defending his title against Ishii. So these two had a great match in the New Japan Cup, I really love that. Um, people have, like, you guys have to realise, I, and I know there are still quite a large number of detra why can't I... There are still a large number of detractors. That was weird. I just fucking... My brain just froze for a second. I couldn't say that. Um, yeah, there are a large number of Tai Chi detractors. Um, like, the last two years, have you guys not been paying attention? Tai Chi's been good. Tai Chi has been very fucking good. He has been working the strong style style very well. And his his matches for the Never Openweight title have been very good. And uh, this was another match here. I feel like other people may be, like, even higher on this match than me. But, um, yeah. So, in that New Japan Cup match, Ishii beat Tai Chi. And Tai Chi, he wasn't champion at that time. But, you know, he became champion so Ishii's like hey I'm cashing in my I'm cashing in uh my win to you know go on Smackdown Live and win your WWE title that's exactly what Ishii said word for word in one of the backstage interviews at least so I've heard from a, a second hand source so it was very cool because at the start of the match Taichi we know the deal he's gonna you know sort of you know smarmy little smile at Ishii then he's gonna roll out of the ring and walk around and Ishii he's like okay no I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit for this well actually I should have said it would have been smarter if I said I'm not gonna stand for this in my Ishii impersonation but impersonate and fuck what is wrong with my head impersonation because then that is what Ishii actually did as he just lay down and he was sort of like playing like I don't know like a like a submissive animal I guess he was sort of goading Taichi to coming back into the ring and attacking him by sort of being like oh yeah Taichi you're so cool look at me I'm I'm lying down I'm easy pickings and um this actually got to Taichi and yeah we didn't actually get any more Taichi shenanigans um at least in the in the form of time wasting and trying to get in Ishii's head as he immediately got right into his face and yeah they just started like facing off with big strikes um Ishii obviously he's the four-time never openweight champion he's he's the one that really made this title what it is he's the one that made people say oh shit I really really want to see the match that's third or fourth from the top of this New Japan card because that's going to be match of the night that was Ishii he basically did that all on his back you know his matches against Shibata and Makabe and um, a few other key characters and then in kayfabe you have Taichi who's oh he's ruined the title and, and people do genuinely say this but in, I say this in kayfabe because the idea is oh Taichi works a totally different formula as I said um, we didn't see it here but he usually goes for the time wasting style trying to dictate the pace um, also a lot of you know use of his mic stand of Miho Abe and his other girls and the other Suzuki Gun members interfering on his behalf, and I do think that adds to a lot of his matches. And um, you know, if if not only just because his strong style stuff works, and then you have the you know the the mellow melodrama sports opera sort of stuff, um, whatever that means. Uh, I just like that dynamic. And yeah, this was just a different a, a different style to the Taichi match because we went right into the strong style exchanges. Both guys were going very hard with their strikes, and um, Taichi he was looking great hitting all of his kicks. And as usual, you know, Taichi being a boy of Kawada, he was getting in all the Kawada tribute spots. You know, the dangerous backdrop, the gum and Gary, the stretch plum, and yeah, I just I just pop for all of those. They did have a few awkward moments as they picked up the pace and started going for like the big strike exchanges, but um, luckily they always managed to maintain that really exciting atmosphere, uh, especially as Taichi, he went for like all of his energetic kicks, which involve a lot of running and jumping around, uh, plus his surprisingly very powerful lariats, and like the way he hits all of his kicks, like his super kicks, the buzzsaw kicks, the Garmin Garys, uh, I think also the Enzo Garys, just like all of his kicks, they just look fantastic, I don't know what it is about him, it's just the, the little like style, the little flair he has as he jumps and then like, you know, twists his body to execute 
execute those moves. Like, there's no one that really delivers kicks like him. Like, you think of the only other, what, like, well-known kicker in New Japan is probably Ibushi for, like, his, I think he has, like, a kickbox, uh, a kickboxing background. But, yeah, just the the style of Tai Chi. This is this is what I love about Tai Chi. Well, I, I say love, but, you know, I don't love Tai Chi. I do think he's heavily underrated. But, um, yeah, it's like, when when I hear people criticize Tai Chi, it's like, don't you see, didn't you see him hit that gum and Giri, like, right on Ishii's face? Didn't you see him hit that buzzsaw kick, like, with perfect timing and, like, you know, right, right, right on Ishii's head and you know obviously Ishii's probably okay he's just you know selling it but it looks like perfectly timed perfectly um you know pinpoint accurate it's like how can you guys just how can you guys not get into Tai Chi uh anyways I really enjoyed this match these guys were going full on with you know constant big strike counters uh fighting spirit moments of defiance and near falls and even though it was all like ultimately generic and I've had this issue for at least like two years I think going back to like maybe at least 2017 where it's like we just came off a run of maybe four years I want to say of New Japan going like really heavy into this like strong style um renaissance where it's like you know the as I said the best matches on the night are like those um really hard hitting matches between Shibata and Ishii or Ishii and Makabe I feel I've just become so jaded to seeing that style especially because I feel like it's been done perfectly with those matches between Shibata and Ishii where it's like okay yeah this is another this is the the typical match of the month where Ishii's gonna hit a guy really hard and um I've definitely I, I definitely still found this match very good you know I gave this three and three quarter stars but I do find myself sort of wearing on Ishii's formula like I think when he steps outside that pure formula like he doesn't go up against a fellow strong style person like his match earlier in the year with Okada where Ishii's working his formula but then Okada's not exactly working the strong style formula I think that's when Ishii really shines as opposed to you know just oh me grug me hit person really hard you know me 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 caveman me just use brunt force uh Brunt force, blunt force. Um, yeah, it's just as I said, I've just get sort of jaded. But look, I really, I've still really found this exciting. Uh, Ishi ended up getting the win. I can't even remember what he finished it with. Actually, no, I do. It, I remember the actual uh, finishing sequence. It was Ishi. He's going for the brain buster, and then Taichi, you know, he like wriggles out of it. And I was like, oh shit, yes, Taichi's actually going to end up winning this match, which is what I really wanted because you know, as I said, even though Ishi, he's he's one of the greatest wrestlers in the world, probably going to be one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. If I if I do have to think about it um I just want something different for the never openweight title and I thought we were seeing so many interesting different matches with Tai Chi and as I've said I know he's very controversial but for me I was really enjoying the new dynamic Tai Chi was bringing to the never openweight title matches um but yeah I thought okay Tai Chi he's escaped the brain buster he's gonna hit something and then he's gonna win the match but uh no Ishii just put on another brain buster hold finally hit the move and then he got the win so yeah very good match uh you know, technically a very generic strong style match, but, um, you know, that isn't a negative because this was still very good. We were then back to the more sort of middling uh, matches on the show as we then went to G.O.D., Tamatonga and Tangaloa defending the IWGP heavyweight titles against Evelyn Sonata. And I am, I am just fucking tired. I am sick to death of this pairing. I looked back and they've had at least, I want to say maybe five matches at least going back to like, I think it's November last year. And that was just me looking at the match guide, seeing what matches have actually, you know, been recommended. So uh, I feel like there could be even more, maybe, you know, up to like seven or eight matches that they've actually had since then. Um, yeah, the tag division in New Japan is dead. And there's no reason it has to be. Like, there's no reason Ibushi and, I don't know, fucking, jeez, who else? Ibushi and Yoshihashi. There's no reason they can't really just start a tag team. I know it wouldn't really make sense if Ibushi isn't in chaos, but, you know, Okay, maybe, let's say Ishii and Yoshihashi, or Ishii and Goto, there's no reason they couldn't be a tag team, just for a one-off, like, we did get that a bit last year, where we'd started getting some uh, more random, like, tag teams, like, interesting tag teams, going up against um, the champions, which we wouldn't usually see, but, um, yeah, I'm just, and it's a shame, because these teams are not bad at all, like, G.O.D., they were, they were bad when they first came in, in, like, 2016, but as I've watched them progress, they're actually, like, a decent team, and even here, I thought they were good, you know, I really like Tamatonga, he's not, like, a world-class, you know, singles wrestler, but in tag teams, he works, he works really hard, he has, like, that sort of, you know, slippery sort of um, intelligent, crafty, like, almost, like, assassinator sort of style, where, you know, he sort of acts like a sort of, like, people describe him as, like, a snake, he sort of slithers in, and then he goes for, like, sort of unexpected big moves out of nowhere to try, um, shock people, and obviously, uh, Tunga Loa, he used to be really, really bad, but then he's become, like, a decent powerhouse, and he also has that really, like, he has, like, a charming goofiness to him, where he just, like, yells stuff out in English, because, like, he knows no one's really gonna understand it, and he can just get away with saying some really, like, outrageous stuff in a really, in very, like, you know, random, funny voice, voices so I do like that and obviously I don't need to say what I like about Evil and Sonata because I mean it's Evil and Sonata we all know them very well um they're both 
probably going to be the next big stars of the company, um, or at least it's going to be either of the guys. I've I've gone back and forth on who I think is really going to be the star. I think it probably is going to end up being Sonata. Um, yeah, they were just sort of generic here, and that's not to say they were bad. It's just like, you know, Sonata is Sonata. He's sort of generic as it is. He was running through his signature moves. It was fine. Evil was a lot more interesting. It's still annoying that I can't get over his gimmick of being like this I don't know what, like this Grim Reaper sort of character, this death guy, it's just annoying because that honestly does hold me back from connecting with him because I just can't take that too seriously with, you know, all of his pouting and being all evil and dark and depressing and, you know, having the eye makeup and everything, but then he actually has like a, a very nice aggressive attitude and he just really does unleash some like really good, you know, power moves and strikes, he's like an appropriate, like he could be an amazing powerhouse if he just got rid of this very goofy gimmick because, and I feel like, like, how would he even do without that gimmick now? Because that's really what he's been built up as. But, um, I think, I think he could totally, you know, live without it. It's just, I don't know, for me, it just holds it back. But, um, yeah, this match was just, uh, both teams going back and forth through the motions. G.O.D., they, they, they controlled, like, the early part, and then it was, like, Evil and Sonata, and then we got some G.O.D. shenanigans, and then it was like, oh, Bushi's come out for the save. He's attacked Jado, who was interfering. Oh, this is going to be a very, um, happy, feel-good moment of Evil and Sonata having their friend help them win the titles. But then they immediately cut that off as like just in the process of Evil and Sonata setting up the what is it the magic color I think it's called and that was like oh this is totally going to be the moment where they hit their, their tag team finishing move they're going to get the win then Tamatonga he just rolled I think it was Evil up and then they got the win and they just you know ran away and it was really weird. I have no idea what they were going for here. Um, they definitely did well teasing us that like, oh, you know, Evil and Sonata are going to overcome all the odds of this evil Bullet Club team. But um, yeah, that wasn't the case. Um, this was a fine match. You know, I gave this two and three quarter stars. As I said, definitely not bad. Both teams um, have an interesting dynamic within their team as well as, you know, interacting the teams, the two teams interacting. So I did enjoy that. But um, yeah, the tag division is just so dead. That, that's probably also why I didn't enjoy this too much because it's like, as I said, I've, I've just seen this match so many times. Um, it feels like a lot of the interactions are just so contrived. Uh, you know, it's just copy and pasted from previous meetings. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm just repeating myself. But um, yeah, not not a match you need to see, especially on the show. So two and three quarter stars. Then, um, holy shit, we had Shibata appear, and you know, I guess it's time. It's the it's the annual. Oh, is you know the annual tease of if Shibata is going to come back to the ring? Because I, I want to know, Shibata, you're one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. I I watched live as you had one of the best matches ever, and then your career ended, and for two years straight, I've been desperate for you to come back and make wrestling great again, and um, I didn't get that, I didn't get Shibata saying, you know, I am I'm good, I'm going to be back by the G1, I'm going to kill Okada if he is still champion, and I'll defeat him at Wrestle Kingdom, I wanted that, instead I got Shibata pointing at the entrance um, way ring part for an awkwardly long time, and I'm like, okay, well, who's coming out, or is Shibata pointing at the, like the, the big screen and a video is going to play, or a message is going to appear, and then it's Kenta, it's fucking Kenta, Kenta, it's Kenta, it's Kenta, Hideo Itami, it's Kenta, Kenta is in New Japan, holy fucking shit, I can't believe Kenta is here, I, look, okay, I would say I, I'll take a victory lap on this, but I don't know if I actually put this out there, actually, no, I think I did, I think I did on one of my Noah reviews, I think I did say, you know, to everyone who thinks that Kenta isn't going to come to New Japan just because he's a Noah guy, you need to think of the reasons why he, like, you have to acknowledge he left Noah in the first place, and that Noah isn't, like, the same that it is now, and that New Japan have been successful in poaching other guys from other companies, such as, you know, Sonata from Wrestle One, Shingo from Dragon Gate, and also Ishimori from Noah, so for me, there was no reason why uh, Kenta wouldn't just go to New Japan, especially because it's the number one promotion in Japan, and, like, it just makes sense, like, why would he leave you know, obviously he was in a developmental part of uh, WWE, well, I guess not developmental, he did leave NXT, but then he was on 205 Live, and no one really cared for him, and his appearances, like, his his work wasn't that great, but he was still a very good wrestler, he was obviously just, um, not only held back, but he did look a bit broken down just through all of his injuries, but look, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm sort of dumping on him now, but like, I'm so fucking excited to see Kenta, because I haven't seen the, an extensive amount of Kenta's work, but I've seen a lot of stuff from his early career, and then like, you know, the period of, I want to say like 2006 to like 2009, and yeah, Kenta is, he's been in some of my favorite matches ever, he is fantastic, and it's great that he's finally back in a Japanese promotion, we can see if he's actually, you know, if he's still the Kenta of old, can he still kick the shit out of people, can he still really bring that, you know, aggressive brat uh, attitude that just, you know, drives people insane, can he really bring that intensity, and I'm so fucking excited because, like, Shibata introduced him, and then Kenta said, oh, yep, I want to show you my wrestling style, I'm gonna be in the fucking G1, 
So this is the second announce, no, no, the third announcement of a G1 entrant. And these three in, like announcements of, oh yeah, Moxley's going to be in the G1, Shingo's going to be in the G1, and Kent is going to be in the G1. Like, holy shit, not, o- like, not only does that alone, like those three announcements make this show like great, but l- the G1 in what, a month, like a month and a bit's time? This is going to be one of the most stacked G1s ever. And I also apparently saw that we also have Osprey confirmed for the G1. And then you throw in Okada, Ibushi, Naito, Tanahashi, Ishii, um, whoever else. Like, Jesus fucking Christ. Those are There are so many potential dream matches, matches match of the year contenders right there. Like, that is fuck, like, I'm just flabbergasted. I can't believe Moxley and Shingo. And then Kenta is in New Japan, especially after people are like, oh yeah, he's going to go back to Noah. God, I feel like we have to admit at this point, by the way, quick aside, New Japan are totally the WWE of Japan, and I don't just mean, oh, they're the, they're the biggest company, I mean in terms of they're taking, like, all the, not really indie, but, you know, they're taking all the smaller promotions big guys, they took Shingo, who, at least for me, as a, as a layman looking at Dragon Gate, he was, like, I forget the exact word, but, like, when I think of Dragon Gate, I would think of Shingo, because, obviously, he's not, like, um, the sort of, you know, the person you think of, like, oh, the, the quick, sort of, small, junior, high-flying style, but he was, like, the, the intensity and the unique style of his, of his, uh, offense, you know, power moves, as well as just high-intensity, uh, exchanges, I would think of Shingo, and now he's in New Japan, and then Ishimori, when you, like, I didn't think he was the best junior in Noah, but when you did think of the junior division in Noah, you did think of Ishimori, because he was one of the most, uh, highly decorated junior champions, and I believe he was also the one that had, sort of, uh, gone over to, like, the other promotions, like, he'd also made a appearances in New Japan, I think he'd also made appearances in some of the US promotions, so when you think of Noah Juniors, you did think of Ishimori, initially you did think of Kenta, but then Kenta, he also just, like, Kenta just r- rise totally above Noah itself, when he went, you know, all of his matches in Ring of Honor, like, Kenta was just a phenomenon all in of himself, and then of course he went to WWE, and he had massive hype surrounding him when he first came in, um, and, you know, that sort of died down, but people always knew, oh, the tale of Kenta, the, you know, one of the most badass Japanese wrestlers of all time, you know, arguably, and now he is, has chosen New Japan, and, like, obviously also had Sonata, who was, you know, I, I assume, I have no, you know, no reason to say this, but I feel like he was probably being built as one of the next big stars for, um, All Japan, and then, obviously, he went to wrestle one with Muto and everyone, who's probably being built up as a next big star there, and then he went freelance, I believe, and now he's in New Japan, like, New Japan are totally just poaching all the big talents from, um, all the smaller promotions, and, we are very quickly going to see people complaining about this because for a long time the the style of all the Japanese promotions was okay you know you have your own home homegrown stars then you bring in more homegrown guys as young lions you train them and then you know you build them bit by bit each year and then 20 years time they're going to be your new your new star your new um set of stars your new ace and i guess new japan has realized in the modern day like if you don't take other wrestlers and bring them in to build up your brand, then your stars are going to be taken. Because, you know, they lost, what, Nakamura, they lost AJ, they also lost Ibushi for at least a year, remember? Actually, I think it was it was about two years, because Ibushi left in late 2015, only came back, at, like, midway 2017. They almost lost Ibushi to WWE as well, which would have been dreadful. So, you know, it's... It's a shame because you see New Japan taking um, the stars. They didn't really take Kenta from Noah, but you know what I mean. Like, Kenta would have gone back to Noah probably if there wasn't a New Japan offer. So, yeah, like, we have to realize New Japan are becoming very aggressive in hiring uh, new talent. And I, I guess my point is I feel like people are going to start really dogging on New Japan, being like, oh, yeah, you just steal talent. You don't build talent. And obviously, you can't really make that argument because, I mean, fucking look at all of the young lions, like, look at Okada, even though he did technically start in Toriumon, he also did go through the system, look at Naito, um, like, they have a, a, a proven track record of building up stars, but I feel like people are going to really start heavily complaining about New Japan, um, stealing stars from other Japanese companies, I'm totally fine with it, I, if it was up to me, like, I believe in decentralization, but look, I would honestly love if we just took all, like, like, the top 10% of the Japanese wrestlers, and just put them all in one promotion, just so I knew there was a higher chance of them competing against each other, because, you know, I would love to see, like, um, I don't know, like, Okabayashi versus Okada, and I know I'm probably never going to get that, so I would just rather Okabayashi gets, you know, uh, just joins New Japan, just so I can see that match, you know, and I guess that's me being selfish, because there are other promotions with other sets of fans who also want to have their own stars, like, all Japan fans want to have their Miyahara, they don't want to have to go to New Japan to see him, or, you know, that sort of thing, I've gone on this tangent for quite a long time, but, um, yeah, the bottom line is, 
Kenta is in New Japan. Holy fucking shit. I guess we don't technically know if he's going full-time. Um, I'm going to assume he's probably just going to be freelance, and he'll probably at least, obviously we know he's going to be in the G1, but hey, maybe after that he goes on his own way. Maybe he goes to um, All Japan, you know, make some appearances in Wrestle 1. When you when you wrestle for New Japan, especially when you get a spot like, like Kenta did here, it usually implies you are full-time, and if that's the case, then I'm going to fucking scream because that's amazing. But I haven't seen any like proper announcement like, oh, Kenta has signed a full-time deal with New Japan. If we see that, I'm going to be in total heaven. Anyways, let's move on to the next match where um I was in heaven. I was in heaven for a slight amount of time watching Dragon Lee defend the junior heavyweight title against Will Ospreay. So yeah, this match was incredible. This was uh like Ospreay, he just had a match of the year contender against Shingo like what, four days ago? And that was like, I think my third favorite match of the year and then he faces Dragon Lee here and he has my fourth favorite match of the year um this was insane this was this was Osprey this is this 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 felt like Osprey's crowning moment because like obviously Osprey has won everything already he's already won the junior heavyweight title and he'd already won the best of the super juniors but here was the first time he'd won the best of the super juniors and then actually won his title challenge that came from it. And he only won the best of the super juniors one other time, but that was when it felt perfect for Osprey to win the title because he came in, he faced Kushida, he lost, then he won the best of the super juniors and lost to Kushida again. And no one really remembers that match he had against Kushida at Dominion 2016 just because it was very good, but it wasn't memorable and it was very disappointing to see him lose to Kushida once again. And for the longest time, it felt like Osprey was never going to win the title. Then he did in late 2017. And, like, he just had an amazing story in the best of the Super Juniors. He goes up against Shingo, who's undefeated. He puts him away. He gives an amazing, impassioned post-match speech where he's like, you know, I love Japan. I'm going to live in Japan full-time um, so I can wrestle for New Japan full-time. And then he wins the title here. Like, it was expected. Like, if you had Osprey lose to Dragon Lee here after just the emotional connection he had with the fans following his best of the Super Juniors win, I would have been crushed. So I totally expected Osprey to win here. And even though I, I expected the result, um, I still was totally enthralled by this match. This was awesome. We got a bunch of great acrobatic exchanges and, you know, big move teasers right from the bell. And then, of course, both guys, they did have to slow down. Um, Osprey, he then gained control and he intermittently hit, like, a, a few less demanding high spots. But when you say that for Osprey, you know, what what is a less demanding high spot? That's like a like a top rope 619 or whatever, because Osprey... Like, uh, less demanding is not in his vocabulary. As he said, he is brain dead. I, actually, I don't think Osprey said he was brain dead. He definitely said something. No, he said he doesn't have a brain. Um, how did I get onto this? I forget. Um, anyways, Lee, he eventually, of course, you know, he does make a comeback. And he hits some fucking absurd moves. He hit, like, incredibly dangerous as well. Um, he hit a fucking tope right on Osprey, who's on the announce table. And that sent them right into, like, the, like, all the way over the guardrail into, like, the other guardrail part that, like, separates the commentators from the audience. Um... Yeah, like, th this is all within, like, what, the first 10 minutes? And that dive, like, even Milano was injured on that, which was very funny. And then back in the ring, uh, both guys, they started going for some crazy acrobatic spots. Um, like, Osprey, he went for a top rope cork uh, corkscrew moonsault to the outside. And Osprey's real-time selling, once again, it was just fantastic. And it made sense because, like, Dragon Lee, he also had some very good real-time selling. But Osprey, not only just because, naturally, when he sells, he's very, vo you know, vocal and loud. And he makes his uh, gestures and facial expressions and, you know, his use of posture, he makes it very obvious that he's in pain. But that made sense because, as I said, the story was he's coming into this tournament after he's decided to move to, and you know, live in Japan full-time, wrestle for New Japan basically full-time. And he wants to, you know, make the juniors the best in the world. And so it made total sense for the focus to be on um, him when he's when he's being worked over by Dragon Lee, like his suffering being the main focus. And that would also build up to when he would then hit all of his, you know, massive comeback moves because then they'd feel even more cathartic because it's like, oh, we've seen Osprey worked over for so damn long. We've seen him grimace and yell out in pain for, you know, so many times. And then he hits this amazing, you know, uh, spiral fucking 5050 moonsault or whatever. It's just so satisfying. Um, as, I, as I said, real-time selling, fantastic. Lee, um, very good as well. And yeah, Osprey was just built up as a total hero here. Both guys were pulling out some crazy creative counters to both guys' signature moves. Like Osprey, he flips out of Lee's um, Frankenstein off the apron, which is one of Lee's like signature moves. And then Lee, um, he did a fantastic like V-trick and knee strike to Osprey's Oscutter off the ropes. And obviously, Dragon Lee, he is... He's about as reliant on the V-Trigger, like, knee strike he uses, just as Omega was with his own original V-Trigger. And obviously that does sort of irk me because it's such a fantastic move. Dragon Lee's isn't as good as 
Kenny Omega's own V trigger, but it's still very good. It gets great impact, but you use it so many times, it does sort of lose impact. But um, yeah, that one counter at least to Osprey's Os cutter was fantastic. And to be fair, all the other times he did hit that knee strike, it was fantastic as well. And I was genuinely fearing for the safety of both guys at like various moments in this match. And um, after I could actually realize, oh, okay, they're not, they're not dead. Then I'll be like able to remember what I just saw and actually process it, you know, all the big spots and sequences and be like, okay, now that I know that both guys didn't die, I can realize how, you know, acrobatic and athletically demanding that was and just admit, okay, that was an awesome spectacle to behold. Lee keep hitting those, you know, brutal knee strikes and Osprey was selling them like death and that made his crazy flurry attack come back extremely hype and then, uh, simple as, Osprey, he hits the top rope Os cutter and then the Stormbreaker for the win. Um, yeah, this match was outstanding. I think I enjoyed this about as much as Osprey versus Shingo, um, but then I think back to how in that match, Shingo was the favorite, and it was really, it was amazing when Osprey overcame him to get the win, and here, it was expected, as I said, for Osprey to get the win, but um, yeah, this was like, when I think of Osprey versus Lee, I believe they had one other match, and this was in 2017 in the Best of Super Juniors, and it was like a block match, and like, back then, you know, it was a block match on a, on a random show that probably got uploaded on New Japan World like two weeks later with no commentary on hard cam, so they didn't go all out, but here, they went all out, and it was fantastic, you know, as I said, just the, the creativity of the counters these guys hit and just the level of attention to detail and executing all of these incredibly complex sequences. Like, you know, if your foot is slightly like off step or your head is like a few centimeters this way, either guy's going to get hurt or the move is just going to be totally botched. Just the fact that these guys are so fucking perfect with everything they hit, it's just incredible. I just can't believe I get to watch both of these guys in their current reigns. You know, Osprey is like, what, 26? And Dragon Lee, I think, is like 22 or even 21 or 23. He's incredibly young. These, these guys are both so young. Like, this is basically the, their prime. You know, for like high-flying wrestlers, I feel like their prime is at, probably at least in their young 20s. And the fact I get to watch them like week by week, um, I just feel so fucking honored. I can't believe I get to see these guys performing these things in real time. I get to, you know, other people all around the world, I get to see Osprey flip out of like a reverse Frankensteiner or, you know, hit a crazy counter to Dragon Lee's Lariat, which ends up with Dragon Lee spinning around and hitting a reverse Frankensteiner on Osprey. Like, I can't think of these, you know, obviously, maybe I could, but, you know, like, if you, gun to my head, I would not be able to, well, I, my point is, I can't think of these creative counters, like, you have to rely on people like this, like Dragon Lee and Osprey, who are just so dedicated to putting their bodies on the line, and just being as creative as they possibly can be, with like, okay, what can we give the audience, which they haven't seen before, which is going to totally shock them, um, make them fear for our lives, and still get them totally enthralled in our match, and, like, they just did it, like, I love this match, as I said, this is my top five matches of the year, um, I gave this four and a quarter to about four and a half, I love this match, definitely another match of the year contender from Osprey, his second of the week you know his second in what five days i was thinking god damn after this match it will be damn hard maybe even impossible for abushi and naito uh let alone okada and jericho to possibly top this now this match abushi versus naito for the ic title incredibly controversial right now i've just seen some people you know at least on cage match and twitter i've been paying attention to their reviews and um yeah it's been all over the place so i wasn't really excited for this match just because um Ibushi and Naito um their first like few matches at least when I think back to the 2017 match in the G1 fantastic match one of the best matches of the year and then every single match they've had since then I've been less and less impressed like it's still been great I don't think they've had a single match that I've given like less than three and three quarters like they've all been at least great like you know about four stars probably but I've always been like huh this is a bit contrived this is a bit repetitive of what they did in their previous match from a year ago or two or three months ago or whatever and this was their third match in I think only four months and I was like okay um, I guess for 2019 we're having a big Ibushi versus Naito feud but these matches are too close together that you know I'm, I'm just remembering too many of their interactions and so I'm saying oh okay I saw them do this spot you know a month ago I saw them do this spot two months ago it, it did make sense well actually I'll, no it doesn't make sense in fact it doesn't make sense why uh, Ibushi would give a rematch to Naito I don't believe Naito beat Ibushi in a tag match or anything to set this up I'm pretty sure Naito was just like yep I want a challenge and Ibushi was like oh okay so that was also another issue but um when I think back to it it's like 
you know, how can I really be upset that I get to see Ibushi versus Naito? It's sort of like with Dragon Lee and Osprey, where I get to see them live through their prime. I guess I, I don't know if I'd say, well, I guess I would say Ibushi and Naito are probably also in their own respective primes, just because they're having the best matches of their lives in the last, like, you know, three or four years. So, yeah, I, I went into this match sort of like, oh, I, I'm sort of begrudgingly saying, okay, I guess I'm going to watch Ibushi versus Naito for the hundredth time this year. And this ended up being their best match of the year. Not their best match ever, but, um, I mean, it's definitely up there because this was just dangerous. This That's why this match is so controversial online. People, Some people are like, oh, wow, that was incredible. Um, I didn't like how dangerous it was, but part of me secretly did. And other people are just like straight up, you know, this is trash. You're just trying to kill each other. This isn't wrestling. You're going to kill yourselves and I'm not going to support it. This is, you know, zero out of 10. Yeah, for me, it's just like, I'm sorry, I'm human. Um, I react to spectacle. I react to things that are dangerous and get my blood boiling and, you know, make me fear for my own safety as I live like vicariously through these wrestlers that I connect with. And for me, this was just, this was an incredible match. It wasn't as good as Dragon Lee versus Osprey, which was also a spectacle, but that was a safer spectacle. And that was a more complex one where it was like more attention to detail and all of these, you know, you know, all these counters, you know, guys spinning around, hitting crazy counters. Um, this was just both guys just dropping each other on their necks. And like, okay, it became a really obnoxious meme where it's like, oh, okay, Ibushi versus Naito, better protect your neck, ha ha ha, no necks are going to survive this match, ha ha ha. And I'd sort of be like, okay, yeah, I guess they did drop themselves on their necks like a few times with a few like dangerous suplexes, but the meme became real here. Just at one point, Ibushi and Naito, they were doing a really good job of teasing a big move. Like, obviously, well, I guess I'll start right from the start. This is Osaka, and they fucking, I mean, I should say at least 50% of them fucking hate Naito because the story goes ever since 2012 when um, he was in Osaka for New uh, the New Japan's new beginning in Osaka show where this was when Okada, you know, the Rainmaker upset where he first beat Tanahashi for the title and Naito came out and challenged for the, you know, to be the next challenge for uh, Okada's title and he was like, Apparently, this is what I've heard, he said to the fans in Osaka, if I don't win the title, you can boo me when I'm next here. And who knows, like, why he said that, because it's such an odd thing to say if he knew he was going to lose the title. Maybe the plan initially was that Naito was going to win the title, and that's how they, go, they were going to get it onto him, by giving it to Okada. Yeah, for whatever reason, he said that, and then ever since then, when he's been in Osaka, he's been booed massively. And in the pre-match video package, they actually showed, like, all of Naito's previous matches in Dominion, it's all him losing. Like, 2016, he loses the... Um, heavyweight title to Okada, then in 2017 he loses the, what was it, it was the IC title to Tanahashi, I believe, and then in 2018 he loses the IC title to Jericho, so it's like, you know, not only does the arena, Osaka Joe Hall, with all the Osaka fans, well, at least 50% of them, not only do they hate him, but it's almost like the uh, show itself, the Dominion show hates him, and so there was a lot to live up to here, and um, Ibushi, you know, he's, he's a pretty heavy fan favorite, and so Naito coming in with at least 50% of people hating him, he decided to just, you know, go full on heel, um, he's mocking the fans, he's uh, posturing and posing a lot, um, he was sort of trying to dictate pace, you know, going back to the original LIJ style of 2015, annoy Ibushi, and then just really heal things up, get really aggressive when he would get control, um, and I really enjoyed that, just because even though Naito is like a natural babyface, it is really fun just to see him, he has such like high conviction when he plays his heelish character, because he generally just looks like an, like an asshole, he just looks like a dickhead who's, you know, like I guess just trying to get in your head and piss you off, he just totally, that, that's just his character, when I look at Naito, I think this is, this is an LIJ dude who's trying to take the piss, you know, get me mad and then tell me I should be tranquilo, that I should be, you know, cool. Yeah, Naito is just fantastic at playing a heel and I was really compelled with those like first opening sequences of the match and then obviously Ibushi, he would get mad, he would fire up and um, try to fight back and that was when we started getting both guys teasing some really big moves. They would hit some like intermittent sort of like signature spots every now and then but the match didn't really have that big feel at that time and then they both went to the top rope and they both started teasing some moves and then nothing happened and then they went to the apron and then they both started teasing moves again and then nothing happened happened and then this was just I still remember this like like it's it's blur it's burned into my mind like when I shut my eyes I see this it's it's Naito hitting that fucking German suplex on the apron and Ibushi for whatever goddamn reason he turns his fucking neck and just like his like the side of his neck connects with the with the corner of the apron and oh my gosh I was like like at least for maybe what 20 seconds I was terrified that Ibushi had just broken his neck that I just seen in real time Ibushi, one of the best wrestlers in the world, breaking his neck on live television. I was terrified, but then I, I see Ibushi lying down, and the fact that Red Shoes gets back in the ring and he starts counting out, rather than, you know, putting up the X or getting people over to him or the ring doctor, I was like, okay, he's probably okay, at least I was hoping, I had no clue. Maybe New Japan are total, you know, carny, idiot, you know, crazy people, and they're just like, okay, we're gonna, you know, call this as a shoot, we, I, I guess Ibushi is just gonna get counted out, even if he has a broken neck. Thankfully,
thankfully that didn't happen. Ibushi got back in the ring, and then he got hit with a fucking reverse Frankensteiner from the from the middle rope. And I was like, holy fucking shit, if his neck wasn't broken then, it may as well be now. It's that danger factor, or at least that I can say in retrospective, that just made this match so compelling. I was just totally hooked. I was Because uh, it was real life, like, holy shit, is Ibushi going to die? And in kayfabe, holy shit, like, is, is Ibushi, the character, going to survive the next move? And... Yeah, I guess um, to some people that probably sounds totally crazy, like, wow, this is sick, Lewis. You're really buying on whether this actor is actually going to kill himself for the art. And um, I don't know what to say. I, I guess I find that interesting. I find that really, you know, I've already, I already said why I find it compelling. You know, the danger factor, um, the, the blurring of lines between real life and, uh, you know, fictional stories. And look, these wrestlers are professionals. We do like to say, oh, you can't fake that. You know, you've got to take the full brunt of that move and these people are actually hurting themselves. But look, we have to remember they're professionals as well as the fact that they're voluntarily interacting, you know, adults. You know, they're doing what they want with their body. If you don't want to support it, don't support it. Don't, you know, pay for New Japan World. Don't give them uh, any online attention. For me, I just really enjoyed the style of match. It's not the most amazing match, but um, yeah, it was damn compelling. It was, it was like, I'm never going to forget this match. Um, even if it wasn't one of the most amazing ever, I'm never going to forget those moves um, and those moments where I thought Ibushi's neck was going to break. And then, like, after that, Ibushi started turning it around on Naito. And then he hit, like, a an amazing package pile driver, the same one that uh, Omega would always hit. And that seemed to drop, like, Naito on his head directly as well. And yeah, like the, the dangerous spots, they didn't get much more dangerous after that. It was really those three moments, which was the German suplex on the apron, the second rope reverse Frankensteiner, and then the package pile driver. Those were the most dangerous moments of the match, I want to say. At least I can't remember any others. And then it was just both guys going for some more power moves, you know, a few other like counters. And what I also really liked was, as opposed to like Dragon Lee versus Osprey, where it was like a, you know, sort of car crash style, where it's like, you know, counter on counter on counter, flip and flip, you know, acrobatics on acrobatics, off the ropes, you know, outside of the ring. This was like very slow there was a lot of time in between like the selling like okay admittedly at some points it was like abushi maybe he jumped up too quickly from taking naito's previous like big move on his neck but it definitely felt like there was a decent amount of time given to the selling there was even a moment where both men were given like a, a double count out sort of thing in the ring a, a double what do you call it a, a refs count and like you know it's moments like that where it's really getting over heavily the idea of both men being totally destroyed by each other going for each other's necks and in that sense the you know, all these dangerous spots didn't go to waste because it was telling the story of both guys just basically almost realistically being willing to kill each other to get the win. As I keep using the word, that's what made this match so compelling. And in the end, um, they were going for, you know, the big move trades, as I said, then they were going for like the, the finishing move counters and, and teasers. And in the end, Naito, he gets his traditional running destino, which always gets a near fall, which for some reason people still bite on, they should have learned by now. And then Naito eventually got the normal destino, the less impressive destino, and Ibushi once again decided to drop himself on his neck, just for the sake of it. And yeah, Naito got the win. So yeah, this was uh, an amazing match, even though I have just gone on about, you know, defending the danger of the match and saying, you know, oh, I actually think it adds to the match, you know, they're, they're adults, they can do what they want for their body. The fact that I was constantly just worried about Ibushi and Naito paralyzing each other, that really did hold me, like it pushed the match very high, but then at the very end, it also did hold me back a bit. So I gave this four and a quarter stars. This is probably in like my top 10 matches of the year. I thought this was amazing. The best Ibushi and Naito match, at least of this year. I don't want to see them wrestle again. First of all, just because they're dangerous for each other. <laughs> These guys are not good for each other. Um, it was a bit of a meme in their first two matches, but it's like, oh yeah, they're going to hurt each other. Ha ha ha. Drop on neck. Ha ha. But here it was really like, okay, I see what everyone's saying. Um, I don't want you guys to kill each other. I don't want you to kill yourselves. Please be safe. You have a G1 coming up. Um, you don't, you don't need to kill yourselves to, you know, get our attention. So yeah, I think it's just like, maybe both guys are just like total like artists at heart. I, I definitely know Ibushi is. I feel like Naito probably is where it's like, you know, I want to give my, I want to give my total life and soul for wrestling. I want to have the most amazing match ever, every single month. So yeah, I think you need to keep these guys apart so they don't kill each other. And second of all, I just don't want to see these guys have another match for at least like, like at least two years because we just got three matches this year. It was already rushed. And I thought getting what was it, like three matches from Okada and Omega over the course of seven months, I thought that was rushed, even though those were some of the most amazing matches I've ever seen, yeah, amazing match, as I said, four and a quarter stars, the danger factor will definitely decide whether you like this match or not, for me, it was a winner, I really like this match, I guess sort of in spite of, as well as because of the danger, um, yeah, watch the match for yourself and decide, it's definitely a pretty controversial match. Just some post-match thoughts here, where are we going with both guys, because I heard it suggested that, um, this was by Joe Lanza on the Voices of Wrestling podcast, and obviously because, you know, I'm a, I'm a shit kicker, you know, no one listens to podcast, I sort of, you know, I listen to all the other wrestling podcasts to get an idea of what everyone else thinks in the, in the general scene, and Joe Lanza suggested that it was possible that instead of Naito being the one to finally get his crowning moment at Wrestle Kingdom 2020, it's actually Ibushi who ends up 
you know, winning the G1 and beating Okada, because Ibushi is probably, like, he's one of the other top stars, like, right behind Okada, Naito, and Tanahashi, so it makes total sense, it wouldn't at all feel rushed, because, you know, Ibushi's been in the company at least full-time, I, well, again, technically full-time since, like, 2014, when he became the junior champion, or was it 2013? Like, you know, that was when he sort of stopped just going, like, you know, splitting 50-50 between DDT and New Japan, um, that was when he started properly focusing, so, like, he's totally built up a, a relation with the New Japan fans, so I think they'd be totally open to that and that's a really cool idea like if you if it's, if it's not going to be Naito who finally defeats Okada at a Wrestle Kingdom I think it does have to be Ibushi because I can't think of any other stars who are at least young enough where it would make sense but then it's like god damn are we really not going to go all the way with the Naito again are we once again going to tease him because like Naito must be like a fucking five-time IC champion at this point because he's just won the title back and it also made sense because he's not going to lose to Ibushi three times in a row is he like I was surprised when it was two times but then it's like are we is Naito really just going to be pigeonholed as the as the one B guy the guy who's always the IC champion always on second to last at Wrestle Kingdom but never the guy who closes a Wrestle Kingdom because I mean that just feels unfair to me it's just like no you know you don't get to take this guy who was like your hottest, biggest star for like at least two years, arguably one of the hottest stars even, probably arguably the hottest star right now in the company, and just deny him point after point. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm just getting, maybe I'm just getting too heavily into the cafe, but it just doesn't make sense to me. Naito can be this popular, this great of a wrestler, this great of a, of a character, of an in-ring storyteller, and just not give him the crowning moment that he totally deserves. Like, people like to say, oh, no one deserves anything. Um, No, when you, when you, earn something, you deserve it, that's how it works, and I totally think Naito has deserved to be, like, the champion of New Japan for, like, at least a year, he deserves, like, a year run, and that's why I'm also thinking, hey, Naito did say at the start of the year, he would like to hold both titles, the IC title and the heavyweight title, and that's why I'm not totally scared of him now being the IC uh, champion going into the G1, because there is a chance he could still win, and then he could hold both titles, at, well, I mean, hold the IC title and challenge Okada for the heavyweight title, and then hopefully hold both titles. That would be amazing, it would make sense because, hey, Naito suggested that himself, he, he said, oh, I'll be the double champion, then at the same time, New Japan doesn't do that, they, or at least they haven't done that for a long, long time, where they've had, you know, double champions, and then they'd be like, oh, but then we have one less title to build a match around for Wrestle Kingdom, and to me, and to everyone else, I don't think that's an issue, like, we're like, oh, damn, we're missing out on one title, we've only got 500 other singles titles to compete for on Wrestle Kingdom, oh, damn, what an issue, like, we'll be like, fine, just, yeah, elevate the US title, elevate the Never Openweight title, elevate the Rev Pro title, do whatever you want, give us Naito, winning in the main event against Okada, that's just, I feel like that's what, that's what the majority of us want, I think we'll be very um, conflicted, people saying if they either want Naito or Ibushi to be the one to dethrone Okada at uh, Wrestle Kingdom, it definitely looks like it's probably going to be Ibushi right now, because it would, it would be very uncharacteristic of New Japan to give Naito another title, but then have him challenge for yet, yet another title, but um, yeah, that's what I'm hoping for, it's probably not going to happen, and I'm going to be really depressed by the time Wrestle Kingdom comes around, but New Japan also does end up usually winning me over with their long-term booking decisions, yeah, as I say with a lot of decisions, let's give it six months, see where we are, and in six months time, that'll be about the time of Wrestle Kingdom, hopefully when I look back at this episode, I'll be like, oh yeah, it's six months time, Wrestle Kingdom's just happened, and Naito holds both titles, that's what I hope for, if instead it's Ibushi who holds the top title, and it's Naito holding the second title, I can't, you can't, I mean, I was going to say you can't really complain, I will complain, but it's not the worst, you know, it's, it's not the worst situation. Okay, so that was another um, sort of long, not really necessary rant, but I thought it was interesting to some people, I found it interesting just, you know, discussing what's going to happen with Ibushi, what's going to happen with Naito, and I also gave that little extended talk because I didn't really want to talk about this match, this was Okada in his uh, first, no, second defense against uh, Jericho for the IWGP heavyweight title, this wasn't a very good match, this was um, a very interesting matchup, because we have Jericho, who's only been a brawl artist for the last two years, he's been in non-WWE wrestling, and Okada has a very clear style, which is, you know, um, slow opening phase, and then big move counters for like the final like 10, 15, 20 minutes, and it's some of the most athletic, most dangerous, most amazing, most emotional stuff I've ever seen, and yeah, this was a total clash of styles, and I don't think it worked. I say that I don't think this match worked because Okada has never, as I just said, he's you know he has the big match style. He's never had like a blood feud sort of style, and there was no real reason for it. It was sort of just Jericho came out of nowhere and said, "Oh yeah, you're the rainmaker. Well, I'm the painmaker, and um, I challenge you for the title." And I guess the idea is, oh, 
in kayfabe Jericho is a big star so Okada just gives away title matches you know freely to whoever's a big star and I don't really like that because you know in kayfabe it doesn't make sense where someone can just waltz in based on previous accolades that aren't even like immediate accolades related to the company and uh, earn, a, earn a challenge off of that but also I don't like you know in real life that other wrestlers are having their position you know their, their opportunities stolen by you know these western guys who aren't even really in the company who don't really go on the tours or anything who don't really connect with the fans like day to day even though obviously Jericho did connect with the fans here I don't know I just don't feel that good about it it's sort of like Brock Lesnar who would you know be in WWE and he like would hardly ever be in the company at least like a few years ago he's, he's in there a lot more now I want to say but a few years ago it was like he'd appear like what maybe once every two or three months or something it felt like but um, yeah, so I wasn't really excited for that. But um, the last two matches that Jericho had, the match, well, at least in, not the last two, but his, his two matches against Naito uh, at Dominion and Wrestle Kingdom, I thought those were great. Like the one, like I think actually, I think I gave them both like four and a quarter stars, which to me is like an amazing match, like like a, a very incredibly great match. Like really enjoyed that style. But for some reason, I guess Naito, he could just work that brawl style really well alongside Jericho, and I just don't think, I don't think it was all down to Okada, Okada definitely didn't look his best here, yeah, I think it's just natural to Okada, I just don't think he can work that style of match that Jericho wanted here. So the match started, and Jericho was immediately working the vicious beatdown style, and uh, he was dictating the pace as he was avoiding facing Okada directly at every turn he could. He would also sort of use uh, a few of his usual, uh, you know, charming Jericho-isms, I like to call, where it's like ringing the bell and then like holding his arms up, being like, yeah, I won because I rung the bell, and um, also like stealing the camera and then um, filming himself as he's delivering a finger in the foreground to Okada, who's like, you know, lying down in pain in the background. Um, I like those moments, it, but it feels like a lot of Jericho's matches, especially like his match against Omega at the AEW Double or Nothing show, it feels like Jericho has to rely too much on his character work as opposed to his in-ring. For someone who's like 50-something, his in-ring work is actually rather impressive. Like, you know, the fact that he can do a moonsault off the second rope and that sort of thing. Like, you know, if I can do that at 50, if I can do something half as impressive as that is at 50, I'll be fucking thankful. But um, outside of relative terms, his in-ring work really just isn't that good because outside of the character work moments where, you know, he's appealing to the fans and he's um trying to get in Okada's face and cuss him out and then cuss out the audience, it's just really awkward. Like, there was a moment where Okada's going for his usual dive over the guardrail into the, like, audience area, and the idea was that Jericho was meant to hit a code breaker off of that, but it just looked totally awful, like, his knee didn't go anywhere near Okada's face. To be fair, this was also maybe Okada's issue, because, like, maybe just the way he threw his body to actually receive the move, like, I think the knees only actually connected with Okada's torso, and then Jericho's, like, arms just sort of connected with Okada's face, it just didn't look good at all, and the audience sort of gave, like, a half sort of, like, like reaction like oh because it's like they realized it was botched like some model just not clean at all but they were also like oh i get what you guys were going for and because we want to uphold kfa because we want to enjoy this match we're going to sort of you know laugh and hum and pretend that that was actually a very clean code breaker and okada is totally in pain and you know um knocked out from that move but yeah it was just the rest of the match the match was sort of just like that where it was like jericho he would go for a, a big move and it just wouldn't connect at all and i honestly do think okada was to blame at some points where it, it wasn't just the case of oh jericho being slow and old it was also the case of okada looking a bit awkward and i feel like just because i'm one of the biggest Okada fans I can think of, you know, um, I fucking love Okada, I love all of his work, I'm usually an Okada apologist whenever people are, you know, shitting on him, I feel like that also leads me to noticing a lot of his flaws, and a lot of his, like, non-big move sequence movements can look very awkward, just the the way he holds his hands, like, his, his use of, like, posture, just how he's holding himself, he can look very awkward and gangly, and I think he looked like that quite frequently here, and, you know, maybe half the time it was because he didn't know exactly how to work alongside Jericho, who's a very different body type and um you know not as athletic as him but yeah Okada didn't do the best job making this match look very good there was a, a certain sequence where well I guess a certain point in the match where Okada he sort of broke away from Jericho's attacks and then he gained control himself and then he started hitting some pretty impressive counters like Jericho would come off the ropes and then Okada would just hit like a really impressive drop kick or then Jericho would go for like some pile driver and then Okada would pick him up for the uh reverse neck breaker and those moments were when Okada really got to shine and that's not saying much because he didn't look that great in those moments but it was like this was where Okada sort of looked more like the um the world class best in the world Okada that we've known of and yeah so we did get a few glimpses of oh maybe there are some you know cool creative ways these guys could interact then it would sort of just go back to awkward big move moments from Jericho and then even some of the big encounters didn't really work 
They even went for like a traditional Okada finishing stretch and it just didn't look good at all. The audience was sort of giving like polite sort of oohs and ahs at certain moments, but it's like, damn, like Jericho is going for the Judas effect and they have no idea how to react. And then Okada's going for like, you know, swinging the arm and trying to um, spin Jericho around for the Rainmaker and he goes for it and Jericho misses and runs under him and the crowd just isn't into it at all. Like, you know, they're not biting on these moments, these teased finisher uses like they would be if it was Okada versus Ibushi or Okada versus Naito or Tanahashi. And and I can't blame them because that's exactly how I felt because I just couldn't get into this match at all. It, it just felt it just felt totally off. Both guys just weren't on the, the same um, frequency as each other. You know, spots were mistimed. The technique was sloppy. Impact was seriously lacking. I think back to Okada, there's one moment where he, go, he goes for a shotgun dropkick and Jericho just isn't athletic enough or he doesn't have the timing or whatever. He just like sort of throws himself down as opposed to like just, you know, uh, fully projecting himself into the corner. Yeah, it's just, it's a shame because I remember so many of the blown spots, even though there were like a few good moments here. Yeah, they were just totally overshadowed. And then in that finishing stretch where it's like, oh, you know, teasing the Judas effect, teasing the Rainmaker, Jericho, like multiple times he got the walls of Jericho and he was just so damn slow to apply them. I guess he probably thought that would build up drama, but the fact he was so slow... It just didn't hook the audience at all. It didn't hook me. Okada did a decent job selling. Then we started going for like, you know, more counters. And then somehow Okada ended up rolling Jericho up in some sort of like, you know, small, not really a small package, but um, sort of like a, the pin you would go for off of a Hurricane Rana. He got that after countering one of Jericho's attempted walls of Jericho, I think. And this was the exact same way that he pinned Omega in uh, the first fall of their Dominion match from last year. And Okada got the win. And um, I was very shocked. Uh, this was incredibly underwhelming, even though I do love the idea of Okada in a big match, winning a match without using his finisher, it's a very cool idea, yeah, I didn't want the match to end this way, I wanted us to at least try see something uh, remotely similar to the usual big New Japan, big main event style of, you know, crazy counters, very intense near falls, you know, fans at the edge of their seat biting on everything, but we didn't get that, and... I'm sick of Jericho in New Japan. Um, he did have those two great matches with Naito, but uh, I feel like going back to the Jericho well, you get diminishing returns. Um, I didn't think the match with uh, Omega was great. I thought it was a good match. I think I gave that like, you know, three and a quarter to about three and a half stars. So, you know, I don't think it was, you know, great, but I thought it was um, pretty good. And then this match, um, I gave this two and three quarter stars. And I honestly can't remember the last time I gave uh, a Dominion main event, let alone a big Okada match, like less than three and a half stars, I think. Like this was majorly disappointing. And in the post-match, I was like, oh, maybe they're going to do like a really big angle so everyone goes home happy because they had uh, Jericho continue going after Okada. Like um, he put like a chair around his neck, ran him into the ring pole. Then I think he went for a table spot. And then like Tanahashi, he jumped out and saved him. And even that was a bit awkward because Tanahashi's got like the headset on. He's got to throw that on. Then he's got to jump over the table, over the guardrail, and then sort of brawl with Jericho. Yeah, it was just all, I was hoping for something really big that would make up for this underwhelming main event, and then it was just Jericho going on mic and sort of, uh, I guess, establishing that his next rivalry, which means he's going to sadly still be in New Japan, but his next match is going to be with Tanahashi, I guess, because, you know, Tanahashi interfered by saving Okada, and, I mean, that could be very interesting because it's two uh, legends of their respective countries and respective promotions going up against each other, and they're both... I mean, Jericho's far more broken down than Tanahashi, but Tanahashi is also quite beaten down. So it'll be interesting to see what sort of match they can have. Yeah, that didn't make up for this match. And then Tanahashi, he walks Okada to the back, and Okada for, well, I guess this, this must be the first time since, let's see, 2014? Maybe even before then. Like, maybe, I think this may be the first time since 2012 that Okada has won um, at Dominion and has not and, and has not given a you know, post-match, like, celebration promo, because the audience, they massively booed after Okada and Tanahashi uh, left the arena, and then the announcer, you know, announced in Japanese, I don't know what he said, you know, probably, the show is now over, sorry for that very disappointing main event, go home, they said something like that, and then the audience started booing, and I, I think I even saw someone, like, um, throw some food or a can into the ring, and it's like, holy shit, this is Japan, like, one of the most, like, clean, polite people I've ever seen, and someone threw, like, some food into the ring, like, damn, like, that's a massive riot, like, relative to um, how well-composed Japanese fans usually seem, but, um, yeah, very odd decision, as I said, I I do like that they try to step out of the usual Okada formula of, you know, slow first 20 minutes, then really explosive final 10 minutes, because I can enjoy that, other people hate it, and even though I can enjoy it, sometimes I find myself saying, that was good, but it wasn't great, and, yeah, so I guess this match, if anything, it sort of proved 
there's a reason why Okada works that style of, you know, slow 20 minutes, explosive final 10 minutes, because that's his style. And if you force him to work sort of a blood feud, especially when there's a blood feud with no real story behind it, like here, it just doesn't work. Jericho, still going to be in New Japan, going to be up against Tanahashi. Interesting. Um, I'm at least glad Okada retained the title. I've seen some people say this was a, a very good match. I feel like they're probably... And I don't mean to demean them, but I feel like they're probably just saying that just because it was such a unique match for Okada to engage in. Yeah, some other people have just been saying that it was an outright bad match. I wouldn't say that. You know, it was a fine match. Two and three quarter stars. Honestly, this was about equal to G.O.D. versus Evelyn Sonata, but this had a lot more to live up to and didn't nearly surpass that, especially after following Dragon Lee versus Osprey and Ibushi versus Naito, which were, you know, two amazing matches. You know, uh, I assume most people will go either way on which one of those was match of the night. And then you just have this. Like, I don't know, it's just depressing. Okada's reign, you know, I wasn't the happiest that he beat Jay White. I felt like it really undercut not only Jay White's first reign, which is a historic thing, but also the story of Okada's struggle of, you know, his downfall and redemption. And then he had a very disappointing match against Sonata, which I still thought was a good match. I still gave that, that like three and a half stars, but other people hated it. And then we have this. Um, Yeah, this is definitely not the legendary Okada reign of 2016 to 2018 that we um, all fawned over, at least not not thus far. Yeah, I'm, I'm at this moment, I'm really worried that people are going to start heavily turning on Okada. And to be fair, he slightly deserves it. He, he's, when he's had his big match formula, you know, against Sonata, it hasn't been the most exciting. And when he works outside that formula, it, wasn't the, it was very disappointing. So, look, who knows what's going to happen. But yeah, look, that is the end of my Dominion review. So what do I think of this? This was an 8 out of 10. This was a great show, you know, probably a show of the year contender in spite of, you know, the, the super flat finish to a super flat main event. But um, look, let's remember the great stuff, okay? Firstly, we had the announcements of Moxley, Shingo, and Kenta, who's debuting, uh, all of those being in the G1, so yeah, uh, like, incredible. Early announcements for the G1, looking like the most stacked G1 ever, as well as, apparently, I did see somewhere mentioned that Osprey is also going to be in the G1. If that's true, insane, crazy if true, this is going to be amazing. So, you know, those announcements, even though they're not, like, big moments of the show overall, that really did add to just, like, the very incredible like atmosphere of the ma of the show where it's like oh you got this crazy match between um Taichi and Ishii and then oh Kent is debuting and then you've got uh Ishii and oh sorry then you've got um uh, Ibushi and Naito and then you think back to oh and then Shingo's going to be going heavyweight for a bit so yeah it really did like when, when I think of the show I'm going to think of you know um those amazing matches Lee versus Osprey and Ibushi versus Naito and then I'm also going to think of like Taichi versus Ishii a very good match I'm also going to think of the decent little tease we had of Shingo going heavyweight and you know for better or for worse I am going to remember the very interesting experiment of Jericho versus Okada so yeah I do think there was a, a lot of uh, interesting stuff on the show, a lot of great matches, so yeah, 8 out of 10, probably, I feel like this might be my show of the year, just because, like, as an overall show, not just, oh, what is, um, what had the best number, like, the, the greatest number of great matches, because this had only two great matches for me, but then, as I said, those announcements of the G1, and also the G1 entrance, and also, like, Shibata's appearance, that always gets, like, a, a massive pop from me, always, uh, makes a show, uh, very memorable to me as well, so yeah, a great show, so yeah, um, let's look forward to, or actually, am I going to go through the best of the Super Juniors, I think I'll go through the best of the Super Junior stuff very, very quickly, just a very quick overview, and then I'll go through what my next shows for review are, so some of the matches from these best of the Super Junior shows are like a month old, it feels like, or you know, like at least two weeks old, which is like basically all a year old in terms of being a wrestling fan, so it's not like I'm going to be like, okay, day one, Tiger Mask versus Takamachi Noku, what do I think about this match, like I'm not going to, you know, bother going through that because you guys don't care about what I think of, you know, the likes of Kanemaru versus Titan, and I don't care enough to talk about that, so I think I'm just going to run through the standout matches that I've seen uh, other people talk about, and the ones that I thought were standouts, from day one, uh, standout matches, obviously, Sho versus Shingo, some people thought that was, um, like, an incredible match, I saw that got like four and three quarter stars from Meltzer, it got like a, a 9.0 rating, for me I gave that three and three quarter stars to about four stars, this wasn't even the best meeting of Sho versus Shingo for me, and that probably sounds crazy, but I actually thought the match of, it was Sonata and Shingo versus Okada and Sho, I thought that tag match was incredible, I gave that four stars flat, I thought the Shingo versus Sho interactions were at their peak for the year in that match, this was sort of a weaker iteration, even though it was just them, 
but I just thought, you know, I'd already seen these guys interact with these big lariats and everything extremely well in that previous tag match. Obviously, I still really enjoyed this match. Both guys, you know, a great amount of intensity, great power. They're both just great little powerhouses. Show is a lot smaller than Shingo, but he still has, you know, that intensity, that seriousness, that aggression. Really enjoyed that. Then the main event of the show, we had Dragon Lee versus Taiji Ishimori. This was obviously a rematch from their match at, I think it was Hino Kuni, which was a, an amazing match. I gave that four and a quarter stars. This wasn't as impressive. It, I gave it three and a half stars, so still a good match. I'd still probably recommend it. Other people were probably a bit higher on it than me. Um, it felt like sort of a, a weaker copy and paste of their title match. Um, they still had, you know, the decent counters on counters and acrobatic stuff, but it just wasn't nearly as memorable. Like, I can't think of any spots from this match that were original as in they weren't just copied from their title match it's still a, still a good match and the first day of the show that was like a 7 out of 10 that was one of the best shows of the entire tournament for me because pretty much all the matches were good um we also had Skrull versus Gresham which was three and a quarter stars and then the other matches you know they were fine um there was nothing bad then on day two um do we have any good matches here we did have Bandito versus Phantasmo I got that three and three quarter stars that was just like flippy stuff that was just incredibly enjoyable Phantasmo um this was like his first proper appearance in New Japan I believe his first singles uh, match and I thought he looked very good his character work was fantastic he's immediately established himself as one of the most obvious you know interesting characters in New Japan and his his high flying style is very unique he is almost basically like he's like the dark osprey because you know I was going to say he's British, but I think he's Canadian, but you know, he's like, he's tall, lanky, he's white, incredibly gifted high flyer, uh, very obvious, uh, you know, holds his emotions on his sleeve. Bandito was very good here as well, obviously, a lot of very fun exchanges, so I gave that three and a quarter, star oh, sorry, three and a quarter stars, I gave that three and three quarter stars. Then we also had the main event, uh, Taguchi versus Yo, um, this was Taguchi's like first sort of coming out match of the tournament, he didn't look like great but I thought he looked very good I thought Yo sold well and Artuguchi surprisingly got the win so I ended up giving this three and a quarter stars to three and a half stars let's see um day three do we have any notable matches here we did have Dragon Lee versus Sho I remember being a bit disappointed by this but I did like the dynamic of you know the the crazy high flyer Dragon Lee against you know a uh, little intense powerhouse Sho I, I'm pretty sure it was Lee that ended up getting the win. I gave that three and a half stars. Then we move on to day four. Um, day four, we had Rocky Romero versus Osprey. This match got a lot of attention. I really enjoyed this. This was Rocky Romero reminding us that, um, you know, even though he has been the manager for Show and Yo, he can still go himself. I remember being really impressed by just how well he could keep up with Osprey because, like, you, you can keep up with Osprey, one of the most athletic, acrobatic guys in the fucking world. That says something. And the fact that Rocky kept up with him at like every point, I feel like there was a bit of limb work in this match as well. Or maybe I'm getting my matches confused. But um, I remember really enjoying this match as well. And yeah, three and three quarter stars. Then on day five, we have anything on day five. Day five looked like a pretty mediocre show. I think the match of the night was probably Shingo versus Kanemaru. And it was both guys just sort of going through the motions. It was a good tease of Kanemaru getting the uh, win at one point. But obviously, and luckily, Shingo did get the win. Let's look at day six. Um, day six, probably the best match, well, the most notable match for me was Osprey versus Yo, the Chaos Boys going at it. And I remember, I think it was this match actually where the um, the body part selling was a major factor, and I really enjoyed that. Osprey did a fantastic job selling the leg while he was executing all of his usual stuff. And this wasn't like the Osprey performances of you know maybe two or three years ago where he sells a body part and he does technically sell it for the long term, but it's like you know he his leg is injured and then he performs like five flips and then he goes back to selling his leg and you know it's sort of um I guess inconsistent but it's still there and so you still appreciate it here it was just genuinely very good selling like yo yo is always more interesting when he's being worked over but here when he was in control I did like his leg work it was nice and varied you know used holds and um you know some strikes uh dragon screw leg whips I did like that and then you just have Osprey just selling real hard time um, putting over his, his leg injury while also executing his usual spots and you could really you know you could connect with him like oh damn he really wants to hit this crazy flip but that this leg is just giving him so much pain I really enjoyed that so I gave that three and a half stars day seven what do we have here um we had Gresham versus Titan I do remember this being a really nice mix of styles because you got Gresham who's you know uh, a very exciting charming uh grappler a very small dude like 5'4 then you have Titan who's you know got a he's also got a sort of unique um sort of flair to him with his high flying style he almost feels like I don't know I feel like I want to say he wrestles with sort of like an almost slow-mo style like I think of his like sort of matrix thing where he leans back and then just the way he executes some spots like it feels like like time is almost standing still at some points when he, when he's 
executing his moves. So um, yeah, I thought they had a uh, very good chemistry there. I gave that three and a quarter stars to about three and a half stars. Oh, this was also on one of the uh, Korok and Hall shows, I just realized, on day seven. So this was when um, a lot of the matches were good, but like criminally cut short. So we had like, you know, Ishimori versus Takamichi Noku, Bandito versus Narita, Rocky versus Yo, uh, Bushi versus Doki, especially like Sho versus Kanemaru, where it's like they only get like maybe like five to ten minutes and I'm, I'm left thinking oh damn that was really good but it's not like I can give it like three and a half stars which is what it felt like just because it's it's just so damn short and um it was like I was getting like blue balls because it's like damn just give me the proper interactions um but the uh next great match like the first great match we've had at least in my opinion uh probably controversially ever since the match between Sho and Shingo on the first day was Skrull versus Shingo I really enjoyed this match we had Skrull he'd sort of been under the radar for a bit for most of the tournament but then here obviously he's up against Shingo one of the most hyped up guys in the the entire tournament I really like the interactions Skrull he sort of upped his intensity with his strikes in order to meet Shingo and obviously his strikes aren't as you know lumbering and are powerful as Shingo's but he does have the sort of sharp sort of um style to his own attacks um, I thought they had very good chemistry Skrull's working his you know usual villain you know charming persona the character work and uh, Shingo just continues looking like a badass I gave this three and three quarter stars to about four stars then we had what was initially I believe my match of the tournament for the best super juniors tournament this was Phantasmo versus Osprey this was um very hyped up for me i was very excited to see this because we have osprey who was the first victim of phantasmo when he came into the promotion so it was immediately establishing a uh rivalry between them this was just like incredibly fun not only because phantasmo looked like i was enjoying his character work all throughout this tournament but then when he's up against you know one of his i guess his main rival osprey he was a lot more animated in taking the piss out of osprey and um you know appealing to the fans making fun of them and then you just have osprey trying his absolute best you know giving a very emotional performance um showing a lot of passion um as he's struggling with all these uh you know issues and you know obstacles that phantasmo is throwing in his face and they're both just going through all these crazy acrobatic sequences um really enjoyed that i gave that four stars flat really enjoyed that just you know great great match day eight this was another Kurikan show um one match i did enjoy was marty school versus show um i gave that three and a quarter stars to about three and a half stars i remember that was sort of working you know the bit of the sort of powerhouse like strike sort of uh style i really enjoyed that um i'm not actually looking at any of my notes for these matches so i can't give too many other uh comments for this particular match but i do remember enjoying it and on paper it sounds like hey marty school versus show that sounds like a good match um we also had i believe we had ishimori versus kanimaru and I didn't, I've written here NR, which means no rating, and I think that's because I feel like this was another match where Kanemaru was like being really crafty and like sort of tricking someone and getting like a count out win or like a disqualification win or something, and I remember really enjoying that, I think. If I'm, if I'm remembering the right match, I remember really enjoying that, but you know, it's like, it's just such a short match, I can't really rate that. And then we had Bandito versus Osprey. This was sort of like um, Osprey versus Phantasmo on a lesser extent, just with, with, you know, crazy acrobatic exchanges. It just didn't have that charm of Phantasmo with all of his, you know, uh, heelish, unique character work, which I really enjoyed about Phantasmo versus Osprey. But, you know, again, another four-star flat match. Great, you know, creative counters. Like, Meltzer went, like, five stars on that. I think that's way over the top. But um, definitely a great match. Definitely one of the uh, matches to check out if you have to check out anything from this tournament. Then we had the main event. This was Dragon Lee versus Shingo. This got mad, mad high ratings. I definitely thought it was a great match. You know, obviously, Dragon Lee versus Shingo, uh, very unique there. We have the high flyer um, sort of, you know, uh, sharp striker of Dragon Lee and the absolute powerhouse monster of Shingo led to a lot of fun exchanges. I guess a lot of the big moments where like, oh, I guess I'm like, I know I'm meant to be reacting big time to these moments. They came across as slightly underbaked, but I still really enjoyed this match. So uh, Dragon Lee versus Shingo, I gave this three and three quarter stars to four stars. Then on day nine, this was the third and final Korokin Hall show. Um, again, this was a case of a lot of like, you know, very good matches that were sadly cut short. So you've got like Narita versus Osprey, Skrull versus Kanemaru, Doki versus Eagles, and um, then we get the great stuff at the end. We had Lee versus Titan, and I was really surprised to see this not get as uh, as much attention as I thought it would. It got like you know four stars flat from Meltzer, and it got like only an eight point rating like flat from the cage match users. I thought this was heaps of fun. This was both guys you know from Mexico um, making it obvious that they wanted to show off the lucha style here, and the crowd was reacting like that. We got you know big Mexico chants. It was just luchadors going to town, pulling off some really crazy stuff, um, high impact, very creative. Really enjoyed this this was three and three quarters to about four stars then the main event this was phantasmo versus rocky and i actually thought i was spoiled
scored on this match. I thought that I heard both guys went to a 30 minute draw, but it turns out someone just meant, oh, they went 30 minutes because they went, they went like 28 minutes and they teased a 30 minute time limit draw. And it was actually Romero who got the win here. I believe there was some body part work. I can't exactly remember, but this was another instance of Rocky just doing a fantastic job reminding us like, oh yeah, even though he does sort of just play the manager of the new hip cool junior tag team, he can still go himself. Um, he worked really well with Fantasmo here. Fantasmo's uh, heel work was once again very fun. Uh, I remember there being quite a few creative spots. I sadly can't remember them off the top of my head, which is a shame. I really enjoyed this match as well. This was another great match. This was probably my... I don't know, I feel like I really did enjoy Lee versus Titan, but I think just because of the story told of Rocky overcoming all the stuff that Phantasmo threw at him, I do think that I gave Phantasmo versus Rocky the match of the night nod over Lee versus Titan, and I also gave this three and three quarter stars to about four stars. So then we get on to day 10. Um, we did have Osprey versus Eagles. That was a very good uh, match. We had the unique little idea of, oh, Osprey, he really wants to show respect to Eagles, and Eagles is sort of like conflicted. Um, he is choosing the hellish ways, and then at the very end, after they've had all these uh, very creative, you know, high impact interactions, Phantasmo comes out and he thinks, you know, oh, he's helping out the Bullet Club. He's helping out his, his mate Eagles by um, interfering to help Eagles win, and Eagles is very conflicted, and that's uh, since become sort of a storyline where it looks like Eagles is possibly going to leave Bullet Club because of his issues with Phantasmo, and it's going to end, end up in a feud with them. But um, yeah, the match themselves, uh, sorry, the match themselves, the match itself between Osprey versus Eagles. It was uh, very good. I gave that three and three quarter stars. The main event of the show, I should say, this was Sho versus Ishimori, and it was very disappointing. I was like, you think of Sho and Ishimori, you, you're hoping for a, you know, a high octane, um, crazy powerhouse versus um, super high flyer match, and we did get teasers of that, but it, it just didn't pay off in the end. I did still give it three and a quarter stars because the few interactions um, playing on that dynamic that we did get, they still were pretty fun, but yeah, they, they didn't use their abilities to um, um, their, their highest potential. Day 11, we don't really have anything too noteworthy. I think I gave this another 5 out of 10, so, you know, a pretty mediocre show. Day 12, did we have anything? We did have Osprey versus Doki. Doki, I haven't spoken about him. He got a lot of flack early on that I was hearing, and I guess it's because people were saying, oh, he looks like a grimy sort of indie sleaze dude, but, like, if you actually watch his matches, he's doing some pretty creative stuff. Like, he's got the um, splits. He's got a, a lot of move, moves we don't usually see. He's got that sort of um, double um, armbar move. He's got the um, double stomp. I think he's, uh, he's a very fun sort of cheeky character, unique offense, and I, th I would be happy if he stayed in New Japan. If he joined Suzuki-gun, he'd obviously fit total, like, totally fit in. He was brought in by Taichi, I believe. He, he's basically sort of like a like, I honestly think I prefer him to Desperado, and I know people will hate that because, you know, everyone for some reason loves Desperado, and Desperado, I just don't connect with him at all. I understand his, like, I get his charm, but just not to the same level that other people put him over as having, and, um, yeah, Doki won me over, and, uh, his match against Osprey here, I thought he worked very well. He kept up with Osprey, and this is another instance where, like, oh, like, Rocky Romero keeping up with Osprey, that means Rocky Romero is, like, is very good, and Doki being able to keep up with Osprey as he did here, very good, very impressive of Doki, and look, he went like two and, like, I think he only got two points in the entire tournament, so let's give Doki some respect, okay, he get, he came here, he only got a win over a young lion of all people, and he gave us some, you know, pretty good uh, performances otherwise, so let, let's show a bit of respect to Doki, okay, the other match on the show that was worth talking about, this was Phantasmo versus Taguchi, this was, oh yeah, this was when Taguchi got the win, I believe, because before this, it looked like, oh, Phantasmo is probably going to be in the running to win the block, Taguchi came out of nowhere, you know, this match was fun because they worked in the comedy style, and then this was another instance of Taguchi, sort of like, you know, Rocky Romero, reminding us, oh, he has his own role in the company, he's not like the junior star he was five years ago, but he can still work, so yeah, we got, you know, comedy Taguchi, we also got big match Taguchi, it wasn't like a, a high-end match, but I, I did really enjoy that, then on day 13, what do we have here, um, oh yeah, this was when it came down to Shingo versus Ishimori for the title, so no one else was in contention, we did have a pretty good match between Gresham and Sho at the start, this was like some very fun um, trading of grapples, and also some power moves, I believe, also some fun strikes, um, it sounds generic, but I really enjoyed that, Gresham has a very sort of charming, uh, like to, well, I guess just a general charm to him, when he's executing his grapples and showing off his style, he's got a lot of flair, where he comes across as arrogant, but not like annoyingly arrogant, because he wants to show off his stuff, but you don't feel like he's trying to be a dickhead about it, and obviously show like just incredibly intense, very aggressive, um, this was a match where I was like, damn, this match, if Gresham was in the running at the end of the block, or, and obviously, ideally, if show was as well, then this probably would have gotten, um, like, way more attention to detail, it would have been, like, way more exciting, I haven't seen many people talking about this match, which is surprising, because I thought this would be totally up a lot of people's alleys, but, um, yeah, I really enjoyed this match, I gave this three and a half stars, then we 
we also had Dragon Lee versus Skrull. I sadly can't remember the result of this match. I, I'm assuming Dragon Lee probably won because he dropped so many falls as champion. This is another instance of both guys with a, a pretty unique style. Dragon Lee is a lot more of the car crash sort of style, like, you know, um, incredibly acrobatic sort of high flyer, whereas Skrull... He's not much a high flyer, really. Like, he does sort of work the acrobatic style at times, but he's more of a sort of, you know, sharp striker, a lot of grappling, obviously, going for targeting the arm and the fingers and everything. I thought their styles worked really well. I also gave that three and a half stars. Then we had Shingo versus Ishimori for what was, I think, the A block finals, or whatever block they were in, it was the finals. And... It was a very good match, okay? It was very good, but I was disappointed. I was hoping for a totally, like, blow-away match for, you know, the, the block decider to get into the finals, and it wasn't that. We did get, you know, a nice... Because this was, like, the meeting of New Japan's two most highly regarded poached talents. We had Shingo from Dragon Gate and Ishimori from Noah. And we got some very fun, you know, a use of the dynamic of, obviously, Shingo the powerhouse, Ishimori the crazy high flyer. Um, they led to a lot of fun moments and some some pretty fun creative uh, exchanges, but it felt like, you know, damn, I've, I've seen Shingo have these interactions of, you know, powerhouse versus high flyer way better with other people other than Ishimori. And it was like the same with Ishimori, where it's like, damn, I feel like I've seen Ishimori work his acrobatic style against a more serious, you know, uh, straight monster style with people far better than he did here with Shingo. And it sounds like I'm shitting on the match, but I still found it very good. You know, I gave it three and three quarter stars a lot of other people have enjoyed it a lot more than me it's just like this is the thing for the best of the super juniors though because when they have their finals for the blocks as opposed to like the g1 where the final for the a block or the b block is usually like a match of the year contender they just don't do that for the best of the super juniors and i don't think that's the you know backstage new japan management being like okay you got to make sure this match isn't as impressive because then it takes away from the finals but yeah just for some reason the like the block finals of the best of super juniors are never as memorable as the finals themselves whereas with the g1 itself like people will always argue oh no the a block final was totally better than the finals or they'll say alternatively oh no the b block finals were so much better than the finals anyways a uh, very good match gave that three and three quarter stars then we had the final day day 14 the matches on the undercard um none of them really mattered i don't think anyone other than osprey or taguchi could have made it through to the finals sort of similar to shingo and ishimori being the uh sole deciding match for the a block final finals and so the all the undercard matches were fine but they didn't have too many stakes to them then we had osprey versus taguchi and this was a great match this was once again at the start taguchi is working his comedy style and osprey is sort of complying with him you know sort of being a bit more goofy and then osprey sort of starts mocking taguchi you know stealing some of his hip attacks and everything and that's when taguchi he still sort of throws in a few comedy spots from there on but he also starts working his big match style more and um obviously this was also i didn't mention this was a rematch from their um their great uh best of the super juniors 20 16 final match where the story was Osprey was having his leg targeted by well the ankle targeted I should say by Taguchi with the oh my and Garfun uh, Garfunkel or Garankel hold and uh, Taguchi was doing that again here Osprey was doing a fantastic job selling um, doing a great job teasing tapping out to the ankle hold whenever Taguchi would get it on and Taguchi was doing a great job just transitioning to and from the ankle hold pulling it out of nowhere and once again just like as I said with Rocky Romero also Doki Taguchi did a very good job keeping up with Osprey and actually like like keeping on his pace like able to deliver his own big moves um at you know appropriate timing and having osprey sell them appropriately so yeah once again taguchi big match taguchi coming out here and i was really i was sort of secretly hoping taguchi would make it through to the finals just because i'm a massive taguchi fan it wasn't to be the case i was ultimately happy with osprey making it through and um yeah this was this was a great match i really enjoyed this i love the teasers of taguchi i always pop when taguchi sort of drops the comedy and proves that he's a serious wrestler like a serious character with you know actual drive and determination not just a guy who's happy to just um play his comedy stuff so i really enjoyed this three and three quarter stars to about four stars okay and what i thought would be a very quick overview has sort of turned into a, a bit of a long i guess mini segment so we're finally at the final day of the best of super juniors this was day 15 so this was the finals of the block b winner osprey versus the block a winner shingo i'm pretty sure i have those blocks around the right way and we also had the special singles match of tanahashi versus jay white and we also had the united states champion juice robinson defending the title against john moxley so yeah i guess i'll just start with tanahashi versus jay I really enjoyed this. I was a bit like, oh, we've seen so many Tanahashi versus Jay White matches. I don't think I need to see this again. But um, I was happy I got this because it's Tanahashi's first match back since being injured I think since the New Japan Cup, I want to say, his first singles match, and obviously they'd already set up a story with Jay White being like, you know, Tanahashi, you should have stayed injured, you don't get to challenge for the title, you're at the back of the line, I'm the guy who put you away, so you don't even get to, you know, come back into New Japan and try to set yourself up as the, the next challenger, and he went after Tanahashi's arm again, this match was very good, I really enjoyed this, we have Jay White with his usual fantastic heel work, 
like I would think of Fantasmo and him being a heel in the best of the super juniors was he was sort of like a lovable heel because he'll do something really goofy or like he'd like throw a fan's hat and he'd you know that's like gets good heel work but then he'd do some crazy flips and it's like damn how can you hate this dude but with Jay White, he generally just gets total full-on heel heat. Tanahashi obviously being a fantastic babyface, selling big time. He definitely looked way better here than he did in the tag match he had on the Dominion show. He also got to, he, he worked pretty well with Jay White. Like they did have some moments of awkwardness, which I would put down to Tanahashi sort of being a bit too slow, being a bit off of Jay White's pace. Yeah, I thought, you know, the power moves these guys traded looked very good. I thought Jay White's work on Tanahashi's arm was very good as Tanahashi was likewise trying to target Jay White's leg. So, you know, he's got to, got that sort of dual limb work I really enjoyed that and the finish was very cool as well as Tanahashi it looks like he's going to I think he was going to put Jay White into the Texas Cloverhold which obviously would target sort of the back and um, also the legs which would you know possibly give Tanahashi a potential moment to tap Jay White out but then Jay White he just like sort of pulled him down into a small package while also applying a Kimura I think and that was very cool because it's almost like he only got the pin because he was applying a submission hold which was targeting the weakened arm so I really enjoyed that uh, you know very strong character work from both guys even if it was a bit sloppy at moments I still really enjoyed that very strong selling and once again I just love how crafty Jay White is and how slimy he is where it's like you know he, he can actually wrestle like in kayfabe he is a very good wrestler who for some reason like we're the only ones who realize wow Jay White would be a great wrestler if he didn't become a heel and that's what makes him you know so compelling because he's got great power moves great you know strikes great holds he's very intelligent with how he knows when and when not to engage with his opponents and he knows exactly what positions to get into to uh, get into a a more dominant moment which can lead to control of the match but for some reason he just chooses to you know uh, cheat and you know use interference from the bullet club and it's, it sort of makes him a tragic figure where we want to cheer for him because we realize how smart and compelling he is but he just makes us hate him and uh that's what makes us love him at the end of the day so yeah this is a very good match i got this three and three quarter stars then the second to last match before we get to the best of the super juniors finals this was juice versus moxley and um I was shocked. I didn't know what to expect of this match because, as I previously said, I didn't know what to expect because as Dean Ambrose, like, I appreciated some of his character work, but then his wrestling matches I thought would be pretty limited. I always thought his offense looked really weak, and here, it was like Moxley was talking directly to me saying, oh, you think I'm fucking weak? Like, Moxley looked fantastic here. He looked like an absolute badass. He, just the way he carries himself, like, Every single moment in this match, he's throwing Juice Robinson, crashing into the barricades, into the turnbuckle. He's throwing these like great strikes right to Juice's head. He was bite, he was literally biting Juice's eyebrow and like pulling at the skin to the point of it bleeding. And then Juice was getting incredibly fired up. Oh yeah, Juice even fucking cut his dreadlocks. Like holy shit, I remember ages ago, Juice teased, he posted like a photo on Twitter of supposed dreadlocks that had been cut off in the basin, and then it was just a, a prank, but here, like I, I do love when a wrestler feels like they got to like drastically change their appearance in order to go up against someone in a big match, so I really enjoyed that, Juice did fantastic selling, like I haven't connected with Juice in I think like two years, like I don't mean to be like a hipster, but just as he started getting elevated, I, I sort of lost interest in his story because I felt like he was just doing the generic babyface stuff. But here, seeing Juice work this total blood feud, and there was no real reason it was a blood feud. It was the story. The story was just that Moxley had been playing his like preview video package thing at every moment he could to annoy Juice. So I guess I did sort of appreciate that. Yeah, it, this was just a fantastic match. Just both guys going like real car crash style, but not car crash style in terms of wrestling. Even though their actual wrestling itself was good, but this was just you know weapon spots and everything like throwing each other into barricades just a lot of heavy strikes a lot of weapon usage it was just total fun and you you hardly ever see this sort of match like maybe you see this when Jericho's in town I would much rather have Moxley remain in town and uh, work in New Japan than Jericho because not only were the like weapon spots and you know the brawling spots incredibly compelling like I just keep thinking back to the way Moxley threw those punches like they did look like like shoot punches like obviously he's throwing sort of rabbit punches so they don't look super painful in real life but they definitely looked like fucking like they would hurt and um yeah this was a great match i gave this four stars this was actually a way better match than any of the block matches in the best of the super juniors and I, that's probably massively controversial again i'm just going to say that's just because it was so unique like you never see this in new japan and you never see the style of match from dean ambrose from from john moxley so that was another factor yeah i just really enjoyed this match great debut for moxley very cool that he's already the united states champion makes sense you know from the u.s uh western guy um and now we know he's going to be in the g1 so that's also very exciting then we come to Osprey versus Shingo. 
I, I could say so much about this match, but my voice is already so sore. So I'm just going to cut this as short as I can and say this was my third favorite match of the year. This was outstanding. I gave this four and a quarter to about four and a half stars. Don't let that um, confuse you. To me, that is an amazing rating because this was an amazing match. This was like this entire tournament. Shingo is built up as the undefeated destroyer. You think, you know, Osprey's going to push him to his limit, but Shingo is going to cement himself in New Japan by winning the best of the Super Juniors. And then Osprey's going to go on his way and he's going to go heavyweight. In fact, it ends up being the sort of opposite it I guess Osprey gives an amazing performance this this was the dynamic I was talking about with Ishimori versus Shingo where it's like oh I think that I've seen Shingo work against high flyers way better than he did here against Ishimori this is the match I was talking about because god damn the creativity in these counters it, 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 it was it was incredibly creative just how they're pulling off all these counters on counters and they're working in around Shingo's size and power as well as like Osprey's flexibility and agility and just, like, god damn, like, Osprey, like, using all those incredibly sharp strikes, and you don't expect that because you think, oh, he's the, sh he's the flippy dude, but no, he can throw some massive elbows, and he can wear Shingo down, and yeah, just the way that Osprey took so many moves, especially when he, uh, when Shingo finally brought out the major, the mad in Japan, and it sadly didn't get the pin, but it got a, a massive near fall reaction, and then Osprey, he finally hit the Os cutter because he couldn't hit the Stormbreaker because Shingo is a massive dude. And, you know, obviously Shingo kicked out of the Os cutter because Osprey has sort of been moving away from the Os cutter. Firstly, because he realized it's not as strong of a move as the Stormbreaker had potential to be, but also just because he doesn't use that, use that move as much. So, you know, it's not as well polished. And then Osprey had to go totally overkill at the end, but it wasn't really overkill because it made sense. He went for like a top rope Os cutter and then he held on and he rolled through to the Stormbreaker. And that made total sense and that that's why I say I don't, it didn't feel like overkill because Shingo was built up perfectly as this destroyer who would who was undefeated at least in singles action ever since his debut in New Japan and so to have Osprey beat him it required something phenomenal just like hitting like two finishes in a row yeah if I had to list every single like crazy interaction and you know spot that left me like you know jaw open just totally like holy shit what did I just see um, I would be here for like another 20 minutes because so many of these interactions here were awesome. I can only just, how many times can I say I love the dynamic of the powerhouse versus the junior, but this was the best um, showing of, of that dynamic here that I think I saw. And when I say junior, obviously I mean like, you know, high flyer because Osprey, you know, just like Shingo, he's not really uh, a junior anymore. He also just gave an amazing post-match promo. Like he gave a great promo the night after he beat Taguchi to make it through to the finals, where he's like, you know, I fight for everyone that's had a hard time. And, um, you know, just saying that it sounds like a generic promo, but I really bought into that because I actually see a lot, like I see the passion behind Osprey's eyes. And when he says, you know, I want to give my body to, you know, give you guys the matches you want to see, you know that he probably means that. Like he is totally willing to dynamite kid himself, you know, hopefully not that far, but you know, he's willing to put his life on the line to create this art that he knows people around the world connect with just like me and it's like damn that's totally the sort of person I want to support and then to see him win the best of the super juniors I was like holy shit this is the story of the guy who wants to you know say what you want about Osprey in his personal life you know I think he genuinely does care about people maybe he's stupid sometimes but he totally cares about people he cares about the art of wrestling and yeah I totally bought into the story here of him going up against the unstoppable monster and just giving his entire 100% and winning. And then the post-match promo where he's talking about moving to Japan, like living there like full time so he can wrestle in New Japan more frequently. And he's like talking about how he loves the fans and everything. Like maybe some of it was like, as I said, maybe just me saying that it sounds like he gave a generic, you know, I love you guys. You're my favorite city because I love, you know, Chick's hand to see what city is written there. I love Chicago. It sounds like that, but I don't know, um, maybe it's just my personal connection, but it feels like what I saw, like the performance I saw from Osprey on on the mic, that felt genuine to me. That felt like a guy who really does love the culture he's in, you know, loves the people that he gets to impress with his in-ring work. And yeah, so I was really happy with this result. This was, I don't think this was even the best Osprey finals match I've seen. I actually think the Osprey finals match against Kushida in 2017, I actually think that was better yeah, look, if you say this is the best, you know, best of the Super Juniors match, um, you know, finals or match ever, I can't hold it against you because I thought it was an amazing match. As I said, four and a quarter stars to about four and a half stars. Amazing, amazing match. I uh, loved it. So for the very end of this, I'll just give my top five matches of the tournament. For number five, we had Sho versus Shingo from day one, which I gave three and three quarter stars to about four stars. For number four, we had Skull versus Shingo from day seven, which I gave three and three quarter stars to about four stars. For number three, we had Osprey versus Bandido from day eight, which I gave four stars. 
For number two, we had Osprey versus Fantasmo from day seven, which I gave four stars. And then for number one, obviously, I had Osprey versus Shingo from day 15, the finals match, which I gave four and a quarter stars to about four and a half stars. And then for my top wrestlers, I gave number three to Fantasmo, who I thought gave a uh, very strong showing of himself. You know, I think he announced himself brilliantly in New Japan. He has a very unique style of not only high flying, but also like heel work. You know, there's no one that uh, high, you know, high flies like him. And there's also no one who acts as a heel and interacts with the crowd as a villain like him. Then for number two, we have Shingo, uh, just an amazing powerhouse, worked very well alongside fellow, you know, intense, aggressive people like Sho, as well as he did against high flyers like Ishimori and obviously Osprey and speaking of which number one I have to give to Will Osprey he had my top three matches of the tournament the dude is incredible he can work high flying matches he can work intense strike fests he puts so much intensity and emotion to into all of his performances he does have a sort of generic formula to him but his formula is incredibly demanding on the body and incredibly complex and he throws in enough creativity so that his formula never feels stale and like, I, I, he is, he is a total all-rounder. He is basically like a bushi in, in the sense that he can realistically work the junior and heavyweight style because he can go easily between, you know, the high-impact strikes and power moves as he can with the crazy high-flying spots, you know, death-defying stuff. I guess for my overall thoughts on the tournament itself, this may be disappointing, maybe controversial. I've only given this tournament a 6 out of 10. And look, that's still like an overall positive rating. But it's just, I felt like the tournament, you know, it was kind of good. It was all right. There was really only one match which went past the pure greatness level for me, which was obviously the finals. And, you know, obviously there were a, a few, like a bunch of other matches that I found to be great or at least very good. But then there were a lot of matches where people would like rate them as being you know, absolute world beaters, like match of the year level matches, and I'd be like, oh yeah, that was that was very good, or that was good, but maybe it's sort of like an issue with the strong style matches, where it's like, I'm sort of jaded, so when I see like these supposed big move trading fests, they, they sort of don't stick, whereas with Shingo versus Osprey, like people have given that like five stars easy, and um, I guess at this point, I can't even give that like anywhere near five stars, just because I have seen that style of match so many times, but I do re-watch these matches usually, just to see, have I missed something, is this really five stars? The fact I didn't give this like five five stars or four and three quarter stars that shouldn't make you think oh he really didn't think this match was that good like I thought it was a fantastic match as I said like like genuinely an amazing match if you crack into like the four and a half star range for me that is probably going to be like you know one of the best matches of the year like maybe top five this was definitely top five this is like top three match for me yeah I love this Osprey is totally on his way to being wrestler of the year especially after his follow-up amazing match another four and a quarter to about four and a half star match against Dragon Lee like only five days later Anyways, let's bring the show to a close. What do I have planned next? I believe there is a Noah show, which is coming up soon, and I do plan on reviewing that, and I believe there is also, well actually, not only do I believe, I know that um, the King of Gate tournament is now over. I haven't seen the finals, and there is, I think, the second day of the tournament I also haven't seen, and I'm hoping to catch that before it's too late, because I sort of want to get my King of Gate review out as well. So yeah, look forward to that as well. And um, yeah, I'll catch you guys next time. You can check me out on Twitter at PureGradePuro. That's PureGrade, P-U-R-O. You can also check out the channel on YouTube, Podbean, and iTunes. There will be links in the description, unless you're listening on Extreme Wrestling Torrents, in which case, um, just Google me, because I can't include my links in the description, for understandable reasons. So yeah, thanks guys. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye, forever. <laughs>